That intro never gets old. Lots of big bass. And that's why we're here tonight. And uh, we're going to talk to you guys about a very, very passionate topic for myself, as well as everybody else joining us tonight. And we got a special guest. We got my man Shan in the house today. Uh, I have gotten to know him through his Instagram and recently his YouTube platforms. And he's given me a new perspective on some of uh, what I wanted to know more about uh, coming from a fisheries management point of view over the years. And it looks like we just might have lost him. I was going to have him uh, introduce himself, um, but we can do that as soon as he jumps back on. But Appreciate you guys joining me tonight. I know some of you guys are just on the Real Northern Bass YouTube live stream. So uh, appreciate you guys joining us from there. Uh, it looks like we got Shan back. Sorry about that. I don't know. It just wanted to make me the host or something. Man, technology. Gotta love it. Glitching. Anyways, uh, I was just giving everybody a brief summary of uh, how you've impacted my perspective on our recreational fisheries, and uh, might as well hear it straight from the horse's mouth, Shan. Why don't you tell everybody uh, who you are, what it is that you do, and uh, give us a quick little insight into Shan the Man. Sure. Um, thanks for having me on again, Oliver. I really appreciate it. All right, my name's Shan, and uh, I'm a fishery scientist from the University of Georgia. Uh, when I graduated school, I kind of got lucky and kind of had a path to starting my own business, which I did. And I managed lakes and ponds for about 18 years as a self-employed person, uh, not as a state biologist. Most guys who get my degree are state biologists. They go to work for the state, and they work on public water. I worked on private water, like homeowners associations, apartment complexes, private landowners with their own lakes, so on and so forth. Um, big part of my job was conducting electrofishing surveys. And back then, there weren't that many guys with electrofishing boats, because we're talking the late 90s. Uh, there's a lot more competition in lake management now. And because of that, I got subcontracted a lot by other lake management companies who didn't have a boat. So I've conducted electrofishing surveys in 10 states, which is different than most biologists, I think. Most, like I said, most have a state job where they have an area that they electrofish their lakes uh, in that area. I haven't run into too many guys that have 10 state type experience. You know what I mean? Um, I do. I feel like uh, most trophy anglers don't have 10 plus state type of experience either. And I feel like there's a lot of value in that variety of experiences that you've had the same way I've seen it with the fishing rod in my hands. Yeah. Just to give an easy number to calculate in everybody's head, my experience, um, the deductible mileage that I drove over those years was 1.25 million. Mm -hmm with uh, a trailer <laughs> so i drove a lot i covered some ground um and i sold the business and i and i no longer do that i have connections to electro fishing we got a guy coming in i, I want to tell you about that man we're shocking the pond on the 10th if you're anywhere near atlanta on april 10th man you should come by and check out the shop man april shock uh, job. i wish i could make that we, we we've discussed that previously and uh i'd love to get in a shock boat with you um, that's an experience that i actually have not had uh firsthand yet and i got buddies here locally in southern california who have yeah. joined uh, some of the managers uh here in like the inland empire region and they get to go out and do some of the surveys and uh, they actually just recently did a survey on a lake I fished twice in the last week for the first time in over a decade. 
And uh, we're really here tonight because of how much I was able to stir the pot this morning with a video <laughs> of about a three and a half pound class largemouth that I harvested yesterday to feed the dog. And uh, I knew that by just throwing that thing straight in the oven, not clean, not gutted, not scaled, was also going to generate some clicks and comments and therefore yeah. change the algorithm and, and get this uh, in front of as many eyeballs as possible. Because this is a discussion that I've had to work up to for years. And obviously, if, if you talk to a bunch of your bass fishing friends, and even joke about killing a largemouth bass. It is like the mm -hmm. worst thing you can do as a human being amongst those circles. So most people don't want to have this conversation. And, and I was actually trying to get some other uh, personnel to jump on board. But like you said, the, there's politics in play. There's jobs uh, at risk. It's a, it's a pretty wild subject and conversation to try to tackle. And for the most part, I was actually pleasantly surprised by the majority of the comments. I, I don't know if you took time to go through the 100 to 200 comments on just Instagram alone, but uh, there was more acceptance of the idea of selectively harvesting largemouth than I would have mm -hmm. guessed uh, mm -hmm. And really, only one guy kind of got hung up on it and he and let his emotions and, like you said, maybe some ego kind of get in the way of his yeah. critical thinking and thinking logically. And that's yeah. what we're here to, yeah. to talk about is to have a logical, scientific-based conversation about how we can take things that are under our control. Because one of the first comments that I saw on here before we even started was uh, from Kenneth Thun here. And it's... And it's too simple of an observation. No trout plants ruined it in California. Um, maybe. It's never that easy, though, is it, Shan, when you're talking about like a complex aquatic ecosystem. And yeah, even yeah. in the more controlled bodies of water that you manage, man, it seems like one factor can wreak havoc on your system or your puzzle that you're trying to build to grow trophy bass. And that re usually is the, the, the goal with your projects. Is it, is it not to grow the biggest, fastest, most aggressive bass possible? That's usually what you get paid to do. You okay. know what I mean? That if, as a scientist and a guy that does that in the Southeast United States, nobody's paying me to grow goldfish. You see, it's bass, it's sometimes catfish, occasionally a trophy bluegill situation. But most of the time you're being you're being paid to grow big bass, right? Um, so part of what we what I've been doing online is just doing it live. We've got a little pond that I stocked and we've been tracking that growth live just to give guys an idea of this is what it looks like. And a lot of those guys like to argue, like to move the goalposts. Like, well, that's a two and a half acre pond, and I'm talking about lake. And I'm my response to that is always, you don't understand a bass bluegill simple two system predator system. How do you understand a 36 species system? It's 10,000 acres. You can't. You can't. Ha you have to have the fundamentals. Like you have to be able to dribble to play basketball. Right. You have to be able to have some fundamentals. You have to be able to shoot and dribble and run and have a little bit of fundamentals. If you have no fundamentals, you can't do anything. So ponds are a great place that we can learn, right? And then learn to apply. But just what you said, it gets complex fast. And the thing that I see, let's I just had a conversation online yesterday. It might have been with one of your guys. I don't know. I lose track. They're talking about Lake Fork. Well, at Lake Fork, it's da 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 da. That's great. That's Lake Fork. Okay. That's what works at Lake Fork. We just said every lake is different. Mm -hmm. So why would you take why would you take the regulations at Lake Fork and apply them to your pond? That's not Lake Fork. So that's a huge disconnect that I see with guys. They want to, they want to rubber stamp it. Catch and right. release. Boom. That's a rubber stamp. You just boom, catch and release everything. 
okay, well, for the last 30 years, what about the years when the bass spawned twice? You ever seen that? I have three times, three different times over a 20 year period. I saw fall bass spawn that doubled my about amount of bass fry in my lake. And if I wasn't aware of that, I'd have to, I would have had too many bass in my pond. If there's a limited amount of space, you can only carry so many fish. Wow. So if you stack them up, it's just like a pie. If you and I wanted to eat a pie, we could split that pie in half and you get half and I get half. Add 10 people to the room. You got to cut pieces of pie. We all get less. That's exactly how bass work. Absolutely. I, I don't know how it I don't know how else to explain it. That's as simple as I can explain it. So yep. how do you know when it's time to harvest? We, we use math. We use a calculation called relative weight. That's a comparison of the length of the fish to the weight of the fish divided by each other and compared to a standard weight, just like a BMI chart at the doctor. I go to the six feet tall. I should weigh 185 pounds. I weigh 198 pounds. I'm heavy, right? It's, I need to lose weight to be ideal fish. We want the other way. We want them to be <laughs> over, right? <laughs> so our BMI chart says 24 inch bass should weigh eight. If we have one that's nine, we're doing a great job. We're in a great lake. If we have one that's seven, that's a poor fish. And I can't get that through dude's heads. You're holding a 24 inch bass that weighs seven pounds. That's not good. That's oh, I'd not be pissed. Good. Yeah, that's absolutely. Not, <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a fish living in poor condition. And there is another major disconnect that I have with these dudes. It's like, oh, look, I got this seven pounder. Great. How long is it? Because length is a really good indicator of age. Really accurate, right? Now you can definitely have ponds that get so and lakes that get so stunted that the, not only the bass stop growing fat, but they also stop growing long too. And they stop at about 13, 14, right in there, 12 and a half to 14 is usually that slot. And I know you guys have seen it. I know you've gone to lakes and ponds and done nothing but hammer one pound bass all day long. That's it. That's the problem. Those are the fish you have to keep. When you keep those fish, you're taking away people from the table and leaving a larger slice of pie for the rest of us that are sitting here. Love That's it, love it. it. Yeah, those are great analogies. That's a, a simple formula formula for people to start to get familiar with, to digest. Uh, I do want to bring up a couple points before I lose them through our conversation. But one of the comments on my Instagram post this morning came from Jed Dickerson. Uh, I don't know if you know who that is, Shan, but he got a little defensive slightly. So <laughs> I invited him to come onto the stream tonight but jed's actually one of the anglers that caught the uh fish known as dotty out of dixon he was in that band of oh, trophy wow. uh guys um so he there's a chance he might be able to join us tonight uh and really besides a short phone call conversation i had about having him on tonight uh this will be the first time i get to pick his brain uh in regards to his stance on trophy bass and harvest and uh hopefully we'll, we'll go long enough for him to get through his daughter's cheer practice or whatever he got stuck doing tonight but uh i'm excited for that potential um i'm gonna give you some more background information on that lake and that fish i harvested yesterday to trigger the internet um but also i've already got a couple of questions uh marked through the comments so if you guys, if you guys have a legit question because you're fired up about this topic, uh, please throw it into the comment stream. I'm marking all of the good ones that we're going to dive into in depth. I got one from Anime and Fish. I got one from Fishing with Stingray Drew. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of questions here because these are the types of questions that I had uh, in regards to like, oh, like what do you consider a, a good threshold to kill a fish and release a fish and so on and so forth. And uh, I'm glad people are fired up. That means they care, right? But let's not become overrun with emotion because we are 
so damn in love with these stupid green fish. Um, nobody enjoys chasing and fooling big bass more than I do. Uh, millions of you guys probably enjoy it to the same level. But there's no doubt that I have both a personal and a business like uh, built around big bass specifically. And what I want people to understand is you go back eight to 10 years ago, the decade before that, the decade before that, each previous decade was considered the golden era because it got progressively harder. But it was never easy. But the difference was our fisheries, I mean, they were big bass factories. It wasn't mm -hmm. tech. It wasn't this share lunker program that was struggling to kick out mid teen fish. It was a park lake here in Southern California kicking out high teeners. Mm -hmm. um, throughout Southern California. We had the biggest bass in the world for decades within two hours of where I grew up. And that's gone now. And it's mm -hmm. not as easy as one factor, as simple as the trout plants have disappeared. Because we also have bodies of water that kicked out 20 plus pounders that never got trout. So it definitely didn't help that they were greatly reduced. But honestly, as a passionate trophy bass fisherman embedded deep in this community and culture, it frustrates and aggravates me to see people resort to such an easy cop out. It's definitely a factor on a lot of bodies of water. But it's not the only one. And unfortunately, until I can wrap my head around how we can better strategize as a community to impact that specific aspect of our fisheries, uh, there are factors that are within our control as anglers, like selectively harvesting bass out of our lakes to allow uh, the potential for those genetics to, to kick in because let's talk about those bodies of water that did get trout historically. Would you say that they were artificially inflating the carrying capacity of our relatively small reservoirs for six months of the year, Shan, by providing uh, an un, uh, unintended food source? And, mm -hmm. and I want everybody to remember this. The trout planting program was always, always aimed at creating a fishing opportunity for trout anglers. Never did they ever care about big stripers or bass that became of it. So when you guys are barking up the tree of the DFW or lake management or whoever, you're barking up the wrong tree with no finesse, no tack, no, no strategy in your presentation. Do yourself a favor. Do me a favor, please. Talk about how excited you are to take your kids or your crappy uh, um, uh, neighbors who can't catch anything and talk about the, the fishing opportunities that those stock trout no longer provide because they don't exist anymore. That That's a real measurable way for the DFW to see that the money and the efforts they put into planting trout into our lakes is actually uh, fulfilling their intended goal. So when they're doing those creel surveys, tell them you caught your limit of trout. Because one of the reasons that they stopped planting, uh, at least that's what they're telling me, and this is straight out of one of the managing DFW biologist's mouths, is like, let's, let's say they put X amount of trout in a body of water. Well, they're getting less than 3 to 5% return on catch rates. So to them, it doesn't make any sense to keep putting money and resources into a trout planting program if nobody's catching them. And this is a conversation I kind of got into it with him slightly a little. Uh, and it's because obviously I'm passionate about it, right? And I was like, how would anybody know that there's trout if there's no knowledge of it? And his rebuttal was, well, I put up signs. And I'm like, I didn't see the sign. Like, what? <laughs> why don't you let someone like me maybe, you know, make an announcement where we can build an event around your trout plant and you're going to see a much different result in the numbers of trout being caught. So long story short, talk about how excited you are to go trout fishing. And maybe, maybe we'll see a, a return to that 
hold normal. And that should hopefully help um, one of the big key factors of why California is such a, a big fish producing state. Uh, would you say I'm off base on any of that observation at all, Shan? No, you're you're pretty much dead on. But you know, you're you're well researched, Oliver. You're doing a good job. <laughs> the big um, board. <laughs> <laughs> I would say though, we need. Okay, so let's use our pond as an example. Okay, okay. and then we can get to a lake. I don't have any plants in the pond now. I've, I just got a, a this the the bass were stocked. They were four inches. They're northern bass. Um, they're not they're not Florida. I have Floridas in the pond too, but they're not F ones. They're not Floridas. They're northern bass, and the northern bass are growing the best I've got. Um, four point six five pounds caught yesterday, stocked four inches in twenty twenty two. So growing two pounds a season. Okay, a little better. How did I do that? This is the part. Now, are the genetics of that fish good? Yeah, they're incredible. As a matter, they come from Titan bass. Those fish are genetically matched. Like, not just we take a 13-pound female and put it with a big male and get some eggs off of it. Oh, no, no. They look at the genetic markers of the females. They look at the genetic markers of the males. And they match their genetic code together to get the biggest, fastest, most aggressive bass that they can grow. It's the most advanced genetic fish I've ever seen, okay? But guess what? We're talking about a secondary factor right now. Let's take it back to the pond. I stocked 40 bass per acre to get two pounds of growth per year. If I stock 50 pounds, 50 bass per acre, I'll cut that in half. That's how much it takes bass to eat. That's how much bass eat it takes to grow. It's a huge amount, 10 pounds per pound. So that extra 10 fish per acre drastically changes the growth of all the fish in the lake. Okay, that has nothing to do with the habitat. That's fish population balance. That's your number one. You have to have the proper balance so the fish can express their genetic potential. If they don't have protein going in their belly, they, they're not, how are they going to grow? How can they, how are, where are they going to get the genetics? And, and the guys always miss that. They always want to start talking about, I'm just going to throw Florida bass in here and my bass are going to get huge. That's not how that works because they don't have, if you're, if you throw a Florida bass, any, if you throw the, the genetics that I've got into any system with existing bass, they're not going to grow any faster than the bass that are in there because that's the balance of that fishery. The genetics aren't going to change that. And there's a huge disconnect there. OK, the first thing I have to do when I manage my lake is stock it properly. The second thing I have to do is have gen genetically superior fish. If I overstock my genetically superior fish, they don't grow. The genetics don't matter. Does that make sense? One thousand percent. One thousand percent. Because even here in California, we have bodies of water that are northern strain only. Mm -hmm. um, and shout mm -hmm. out to my man, Ralph Doc Holiday. Uh, I don't know if you guys have watched a lot of the uh, older, um, gosh, what did I even call them? I don't even remember. I've done so many stupid videos on this channel. <laughs> but uh, I did a, a docu-series with some of the guys that really paved the way in this trophy bass fishing. And uh, Ralph Holiday was one of my local guys that I grew up around seeing in our local paper chasing trophy largemouth in the 90s. And uh, his home lake was Lake Casitas, which had Florida strain fish. Uh, I believe uh, Ray Easley caught like a 21 something uh, in like 91, which is the standing lake record. But uh, Doc also fished a lot of the other lakes like Piru and Pyramid. And uh, I even got him to come out at Pudding Stone a couple times, my little Tim boat. And those are northern strain only lakes. Uh, mm -hmm. But they're all lakes that are actually that have kicked out fish to like 11, 12, uh, almost 13 pounds, which are monster northern larger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they had the space and the, the food base to grow big. Um, that that was the key, I, I, I feel. Um, and now that, be, now that we are all so brainwashed into thinking 
we need to release every bass because every bass we release has a potential to grow to that extreme massive size. It's uh, done nothing but shoot ourselves in the foot as a community. And uh, now I'm going to say this with as much humility as I can, but like, I feel like I'm a better angler in 2024 than I ever was in my, my previous years of my life. Even like during these, crazy runs of big fish uh five ten fifteen years ago and the size of the fish that i'm encountering is not representative of that uh yeah bottom line shan i'm tired of catching these dinks man there was a time bro my friends would get so freaking pissed at me because i'd be texting them <laughs> water dude, I can't get away from these stupid seven, eights, and nines. And, you know, at one point it became like tens and elevens I was getting frustrated with. Like really, wow. because I yeah. had this insane aspiration to land a 15 plus. So anything shy of that was a disappointment because I worked mm -hmm. my ass off to put myself mm -hmm. in a position for a glimmer of success. And the big difference then was, there was just a lot more big fish. Uh, yes. There was also a lot more harvest going on. Uh, yes. Throughout the days, you know, the pan yes. fishermen would keep a, an incidental largemouth catch. That was a fairly common sight. Mm -hmm. uh, but over the years, like dude, the public shaming, the shit talking, um, the just bullying that would happen on our lakes really push people to be extreme catch and release fishermen and even with the greatest intentions in mind uh it's had the adverse like opposite effect is that something you've seen in the other like nine ten states that you've uh, traveled to and worked in yeah yeah it's common everywhere and i have colleagues all over the country too you know um this is this is not this is a widespread problem and you bring up a point that I say to people all the time, and you're a perfect example. I mean, I'm talking here to a dude. You've caught a fish bigger than I've ever electrofished. Okay? That's impressive Sweet. to me. Yeah. That was a 17 on camera, wasn't it? That's right. That, Multiple yeah. angles. Yeah. Yeah. I've never even – I've never touched a 17 with a, on an electrofishing boat to tell you how mm -hmm. rare that is. Okay? Um, so – when Oliver says he's not catching big bass, it's because they're not there. It has nothing to do. The fact that you're not catching bass in those lakes has nothing to do with your fishing ability. They're not there. Thank you. That makes me feel better. <laughs> well, I know this because I've drank lakes before <laughs> where the bass are in bad condition and everybody's there. It's usually like a homeowner's association. They have a damn problem, a damn, damn problem, you know, the yep. drain needs repair, whatever. The lake's got to go. They got to fix it, and we got to restock it. And I'm jumping for joy because the best thing you can do is restock a lake. It you'll get you'll get the growth that you're talking about. I can get you just like I'm doing right now, two three pounds of growth a year in a new stock. I'll get that just like that. Easy, easy, easy. I can recreate what you're describing in a smaller lake if you drain it and allow me to correct the balance. Okay. Now, while that lake is drained, will I improve the habitat? Absolutely. But again, okay. going back to number one, the balance. So when you're standing, you've watched the lake be drained down to a puddle and you pull a net across it and there's no big bass in it. You know, that's what yeah. I'm talking about. You're not a bad fisherman. Nobody here is a bad fisherman. You need to learn to recognize the lakes that are putting the, the fish off then you have a chance to do that, right? And there's where that relative weight comes back in. If I'm catching fish that are footballs, all of them, one pounders, two pounders, three pounders, four pounders, diversity of size wins the prize, boys. Balanced fisheries produce all sizes of fish. Tell me when you were catching all those big fish, you didn't catch chomp three and four pounders sometimes, hitting a lure way too big for it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was definitely always there. And especially in the tournaments during that era, you'd see tournament weights uh, pretty much throughout the range, uh, mid-teens, high-teens, low-20s. Uh, I won one event on Lake Paris with the team partner. And, man, uh, 
I was dialed back then, right? And yeah. I'm telling you, I'm way less experienced at that point, obviously, than I am now. But I called every shot. Every decision that we made was the right one. And we, we caught six fish. We had six bites and caught six fish that day. And the fish that we ended up calling was like 613 or something. And dude, I'm like, bro, we don't have big fish. Like, I don't think we got this tournament. Like, we don't even have one over eight something. Mm-hmm. And uh, we weigh in and we, we, we kind of sandbag it. We, we weigh in last. And second and third place at 16 pounds. We had 3579. <laughs> and our smallest fish was bigger than anybody's big fish. Uh, nice. It was a, a special time, but uh, the, they had recently reduced the length limit, I believe. It used to be two fish, 15 inches forever. And right. man, there were a lot of dinks. Like, that's a lake I could go to. And as a kid, catch like 30 something bass. They were all pound and a quarter, pound and a half, but I felt like a badass because I could yeah. swim my little, little grub and, you know, get half my bites on the sink from the shoreline uh and, and get a lot of engagement and caught a lot of fish but uh, it seemed like something that people kind of forgot about really helped that lake and they in the mid 2000s they actually dropped the lake uh like i don't know 60 feet 80 feet something like really drastic to uh accommodate uh, a dam repair that took forever to come together and yeah I believe because of that reduction in a water volume, uh, there was a subsequent fish kill, like a bad one. Mm-hmm. Like there was a lot of dead fish. So I wrote that lake off for years. And I think a lot of us did. Mistake. So a lot of those fish seemingly died right in front of us. Mm-hmm. And then when I started fishing it again in 2012, dude. It was the dopest lake on the planet. And it wasn't like that for everybody. There was about six of us that were kind of dialed in on this bite. And once again, I'm going to say this humbly, but I was sick in the head. Like that, a run that like a a Michael Jordan or any top level athlete has at the highest stage in a championship series or game. Like I felt that coursing through my veins in this seven week span. And I like doubled and tripled what those guys are doing. And what they were doing was amazing. Like big fish were in that system, but not everybody was catching them, man. Mm -hmm. Uh, They were very, very difficult to fool. And Mm -hmm. I actually had to stay ahead of my own bite. I've talked about this a lot on this channel uh, just to continue to fool them. But the difference was that they were there and they were there after I thought they were all gone. And now do you think with that scenario that I described that fish kill allowed those remaining fish to grow mega. Mm-hmm. Well, again, um, you just described new lake effect. What, what? That's what I'm capturing in my pond right now. Two, two okay. and a half pounds of growth a year. Yeah, that's a new lake, and that cranks it. You'll see the same thing going on at OH Ivy, and you'll see the same thing going on at Busty Break in Louisiana. Those are both right. new lakes. They've only been stocked five years, but they're crushing everything. The MLF, every record, every big fish catch, everything coming off those lakes is huge. That kid, I don't, can't think of his name that guides out there. He's racking up 10 pounders out of OHIV by the day. Yeah, it's um, our boy Brandon Burks. Yeah, dude, that dude is crushing, right? There's um, another lake that's in that area that he's been crushing them on, too. Um, so that new lake effect, uh, I'd like to jump into that topic a little bit more because from what I understood happened at OH Ivy, like that lake suffered from a catastrophic drought. And then all of a sudden like a hurricane sat on it Mm -hmm. for like a week or something and filled it up like uh, dramatically. Is that new lake effect possible in these drought stricken lakes? Like Lake Casitas is one of the lakes I'm fishing now that I've been at home again. And it was down to like 27% volume capacity. Uh, which was a tiny shell of its former self. And now it's at 93% and rising. Yeah, watch that one. (laughs) You're talking like 80 or 90 vertical feet of new water. Now, does that fishery have a chance to experience this new lake effect that you're describing with that influx of water, 
uh, the influx of like 80, 90 feet of terrestrial vegetation that's eventually going to die off and create all this cover. Um, what else needs to happen on that lake? Because unfortunately, that lake has been one of the victims of this stunted bass population from my observations. Yeah. Chen, this place was wild. I mean, I caught the very tail end of it in the last end of the 2000s. And, and Doc Holliday has seen like the heyday of it. So I'm glad he's here today. Doc, uh, I got one of the boats tagged for that lake, man. So you got to come out and fish with me. I'll hit you up uh, after this live stream. Um, but they're also getting some trout plants. And I got on people on the Casitas Instagram page for, you know, barking up about planting trout to feed the bass and told them the same message. Be excited to tie up your spinners and your power bait because that's what's going to get them to keep planting those bass. So you've got the return of trout plants. Now, it's not nearly the volume it used to be, but the last two times, actually three times I've been there, I've had trout follow my bass lures to the boat. So, like, there is a presence there. You got mm -hmm. all this new water, all this new room, but instead of like 40 pounds coming in to weigh in and being nervous that you don't have enough to win, like how crazy is that? Uh, mm -hmm. It's been in the mid to high teens for the last few years. Mm -hmm. Like it's pathetic. It's hard to get one over five or six pounds. I see. Now, yeah. So my question is like how – as a community, do we treat harvesting bass in that specific scenario to encourage the onset of that new lake effect? And, you know, before I forget, big shout out to our man Flores here. He was really the only one that jumped on that Instagram feed today with um, that passionate response that I was expecting so much more of. And uh, like I said earlier, if you missed it, man, uh, I'm glad you're that passionate because it shows that you care. And, and hopefully you can see that we all care about big bass and, and hopefully bring them bring them bringing them back to prominence uh throughout california and the rest of the country um these are, are discussions that are not easy um but i'm enjoying it because i'm learning all the time uh, what would you say the if the the best strategy as us recreational anglers should take on a Lake Casitas with the dis uh, conditions I described. Should we start culling these pretty much two to three pound fish? Uh, or should we let them be because now they've got all this water and space to grow with a little bit of trout influx. Uh, guys are starting to see a, a pretty decent shad spawn return, I think, from last year uh, mm -hmm. from all the new cover. Uh, what should we be taking into consideration here? Well, I would just I, I call fish based on relative weight. I measure the fish and I weigh it. And if it's underweight, I harvest it. If it's at ninety five percent or better, I I release it back into the system. Um, that 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 scale, basically the the fatness versus the length, tells me the fish population. And I and I know because I've watched it happen in ponds. We will stock this pond, right? And most guys, what they do is they stock a new pond or small lake. And I mean, up to 50 acres. I've managed them up to a thousand, but um, I've seen it, you know, I've seen it in small lakes as well. So the lake is stocked and it starts producing just like you're describing. It's cranking. It's awesome. You know, everybody's catching fish. I'm talking about, you know, 10 acre ponds that produce 58 pound bass catches in a, in a summer you know, just ridiculous numbers like you're describing, right? But they catch and release, they catch and release because that's what they think they're supposed to be doing and they're not paying attention to the reproduction that's coming in and then that bass population starts to climb and it doesn't take it very long because like I said at the beginning, remember, just 10 fish per acre is a significant difference. So you can, you'll watch their relative weights begin to fall. They'll be like 120, 125 when the pond's new and then year five, you're looking at like 99 average. And then by like year seven, you're looking at like 90, 85% average. You just watch that girth just drop away. And what's happening is the numbers of fish are going up. So the girth is going down. To get the girth back, we remove the skinny fish. Usually like a general rule of thumb, if it starts with a one, 1.0 pound to 1.9 pounds, out. 
Anything over two, back. Okay. That's general, right? Now, again, I, everybody, every lake is different. You know, you need to have, if, you, if you're concerned about it, have a biologist look at it. But just in general, one-pound bass are right now are our enemy. Two-pound bass are our friend because they are getting to the point where they can, at 16 inches, a bass is big enough to eat another bass. And your 16-inch bass help you control the bass population. Gotcha. So what done it means is, is you don't have enough 16 plus to control the ones that are under. And the ones that are under can't climb up to get 16 because they don't have the food supply. Gotcha. Now, when you, yeah, when you say a 16 inch bass can eat another bass, what's the upper threshold over that smaller bass that it's eating? Eight inches, nine inches? Ten. ten. Wow. I don't so even, a 16 inch can eat a 10. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Easy. Um, think about the diameter of the mouth. As okay. long as the fish can fit in head first and not get wedged and stuck, you know, top to bottom, a bass can swallow it. So a long, skinny trout, a long, skinny bass, anything long and skinny, a 16-inch a, a fish can swallow. So, again, from my perspective – when you're not out there catching 16, 17, 18, 19 inch fish, that's, that just strike. It's an indicator for me. It's like, where are, where are the fish that are helping me control this bass population? They're not there. So what mm -hmm. you'll see too, and where, where guys get tricked is those, I've seen this in, um, I, I saw a, a, I can't tell you where it was because I signed a, what are those things called? The claws, but, I've seen a 750 acre lake that was completely with no fishing pressure that was completely stunted with bass. And there were two sizes of bass in that lake, one pounders and monsters that, that ate the one pounders. And that's right. it. There was hardly any sunfish in the population. Yep. So that's where guys will get confused too, because they'll, they'll be one pounder, one pounder, one pound. And then once a summer, a couple times a year, they'll catch that giant and it tricks them into thinking that that's a good lake. But it's really not because that's not the most effective way to grow large fish. You don't, it'll be like you're talking about. You'll have to go fishing for two years to get one of them. Gotcha. So I want to make a couple observations. I think a lot of the concern is that we can over harvest either numbers of fish and over harvest over a certain threshold. So I think the seven pound mark got stuck in that conversation on Instagram with my man Flores earlier today. And uh, apparently I got a pretty small oven. Um, it's the same effect of my five foot nine ass holding up a 25 inch fish, which is you know, <laughs> hopefully when it's got good relative weight, that's a 10 pounder. Oh, yeah. um, and it looks big when I'm holding it. But when six foot five Fred step is holding that same fish, people accuse him of, uh, bullshit because they, they they think it looks like a six pounder right there's no perspective right. there and when i pulled that three and a half pound class bass out of the oven this uh, morning or last night to, to do that video it looks big because it fills up this tiny old ass oven right um, but that seven pound mark seemed to really strike a chord with uh, a few people and uh, i had this conversation with the uh current managing dfw biologist on one of these lakes and this was in regards to a conversation i had to him on one of these lakes and i was like okay so you surveyed let's say i don't know i think it was like twelve thousand legal largemouth bass in this lake like what number do we need to actually see harvested to actually see an effect and uh, man I want to generalize here <laughs> and say something obscene to me, right? It was, a, it was in the thousands. And he's like, even then it might not be enough. And I'm like, what? And then I'm like, okay, well, so apparently we probably can't over harvest as far as numbers of these like one to two pound fish that you're describing over 12 inches. Uh, how about like size threshold? Like should I be throwing fish over four or six pounds back? And his observation from his studies, and you know, I talked about this in several posts leading up to today now, is that you know, over the lifespan of what 10 to 16 years for a largemouth bass, our growth rates in Southern California specifically have diminished to a third of what they used to reach. 
So mm-hmm. with the proper genetics, the proper space, the proper level of harvest, the proper amount of food, uh, fish are growing to 15 to 20 plus pounds. Now that same age fish is six pounds. So I'm like, should I be throwing that six pounder back? And he's his his uh, advice to me was like, no, it's maxed itself out. That thing's mm-hmm. old. It's not going to get to 10 pounds. Pull no. him out. All it's doing is taking up more resources for that next smaller, younger generation that potentially has that capability to grow giant. And I'm like, damn, man. Like, even yesterday, honestly, like as much as I've been talking about this, killing that three and a half pounder kind of hurt my feelings. Uh, because I, I had an irrational love for these fish. I know. Uh, but I'm trying to make a concerted effort uh, with something that is controllable as a recreational angler on my end to hopefully uh, steer our fisheries back in the in the right direction. Because Tiny Bass Dreams was a fun little spinoff um, <laughs> You know, a set of hoodies and stuff that I made, but I don't want to live by that. And that's what no. we're inundated with, man. It sucks. Uh, I'm telling you, I used to like shake sevens and eights off in disgust because they weren't big. And now I'm high fiving for a four pounder. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And we got, I can put numbers to that for you. Um, say we have a small lake, right? Let's say it's, um, let's just say it's 20 acres. And exact same thing that happens. It always happens. They stocked it. It grew great fish for a while. And then it stunted out. All right. How do you correct that? I've corrected plenty of them. Um, You need to remove the bass. Well, how many do you remove? 20 pounds of bass per acre per year for two years. So that's 21 pound bass per acre. (coughs) That's, That's 400 bass out of a 20 acre lake twice that's 800 bass right that's a lot of bass out of a 20 acre lake so how are you going to over harvest the california delta man i don't even think the seals <laughs> that they're complaining about could put a dent in those kind of numbers nah. what you it's, got is what you got and it ain't coming back brother yeah no it's it's wild and Let's talk about this lake that I was fishing yesterday where I harvested this fish, right? So DFW just conducted an electroshock survey, I think like a week ago, maybe two. They did two laps around this lake. And and I want to touch on another topic here before uh, I lose it. Uh, People seem to try to discredit your experience, Shan, because you manage predominantly smaller bodies of water. But like you talked about earlier in the show, you have to understand the fundamentals that you can scale up to these larger reservoirs. And without that knowledge at a fundamental level with a much simpler puzzle, how do any of us as anglers hope to be able to understand the more dynamic fisheries? And just like in our fishing tackle, when I talk about fishing a three inch finesse swim bait on a tiny jig head and then scaling it up to a 10 inch soft bait, it, it, it's very pertinent information that you're more than willing to share on your platforms. Um, so I don't want anybody to, to get it twisted. Like, you know what you're talking about when it comes to growth of big bass. Uh, you literally do it for a living. Um, so, uh, I don't appreciate that kind of, uh, disrespect or shade being thrown your way. Uh, it's, it's very short-sighted, uh, and, and frankly, uh, I don't appreciate it, man. So keep, keep, keeping a, the good fight. Uh, I always got your back, man. Um, let's, let's give a little bit more context on that story on that electroshock, right? So this lake's not very big. It's less than 2000 acres. Um, mm-hmm. They did two laps. They surveyed 2,103 bass over 12 inches. Wow. Is that a lot? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Okay. Because, I, dude, I saw one yesterday. (laughs) Uh, Were they all the same size? Did they have have a diversity of size? So 67% of those 2,103 were three to four pounds. Okay. So he told um, me those are the ones that should be getting cold every yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. 
So that's yeah. why I took that fish home, threw it in the oven, uncleaned, unscaled, ungutted, unfreaking gilled, because I knew I was going to feed it to my dog. Right. And I also no. knew people were going to make comment after comment on the fact that I didn't clean this stupid fish before cooking it and didn't even season it. You're not supposed to season your food for the dog. Right. Well, you, you that makes a great point, though, what we just talked about. Um, you... I just said in general, one pound bass are your enemy, but in that particular lake, three to four pound bass are your enemy, which is crazy. Is, those are nice fish. Yeah. No, I've seen it before though. I know exactly. And it's, it, it takes a bigger body of water. Like the smaller, the body of water, the smaller, the bass usually stun out, the larger, the body, the larger they'll stun out. It's kind of weird that way, but yeah that's again so every single lake is different and we have to pay attention to the guys who actually studied those lakes there are certainly lakes in the world where you should throw them all back because the bass population is excessively low i i don't know if you guys can see me up my page or whatever most of the fish i how i hold up there i caught um in georgia and it came came from about a 250 acre public watershed lake pushing out like one one of my one of my guys in town there caught a 26 that went 13 one so a unit damn you know uh, i've caught 22 inch 22 and a half inch bass that go eight three but how did they get that way because it's a really low bass population and it's luck it wasn't it's not being really managed it, basically what's going on is the green sunfish and crappy are in a mix there that lowered the bass population down, but didn't wipe it out. So there's a very, it's kind of stuck in this probably about 25 to 30 bass per acre range to get relative weights as big as they're doing. But before I caught that eight, three Oliver, I went 20 trips in a row skunk. Wow. Six weeks, no bites, no fish. That's what a really that's when your bass population is getting too low. That's what you're gonna see. So there's your clue when you're over harvesting. You go 20 trips with no bites. Now, I will say I've experienced 15 trips with no bites on some pretty productive fisheries at the time, but I feel like that's because of my hyper uh, focused effort and not throwing anything like smaller than this. Uh, targeting trophies specifically and like man our fisheries are hammered bro like they get oh, so God. much pressure all the easy ones have been caught and uh, it's interesting reading about studies on on these bass that are caught and released and how reluctant they are to strike another artificial lure um, especially when talking. there's genetics yeah that's uh, lure resistance and i have a lot of experience with that um, they can remember for a certain period of time, right? Like I have a feeder that I, I feed my bluegill every, every day at the pond that we're managing. It, larger, heavier forage creates larger, heavier bass. So we feed those bluegill, right? Um, sorry, I'm reading this. I got caught reading this thing here. <laughs> Oh, I see where he's going with that. It's not, it's not directed at me. Sorry. Um, well, now I've lost my train of thought. What was I talking about? <laughs> I oh, got to turn the comments off, man. Sorry. I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read the comments. I do that to myself all the time. I, no, I, you're uh, good. You're talking about your bluegill feeder. Oh, right. Um, so there's a perfect example of carrying capacity, okay? Do, if you increase like a lot of guys like they get these, these bass heavy populations and they want to throw feed to it. They want to throw forage to it. That's not the way to go. We want to harvest those bass. Think about it this way. Every one pound bass you take out, you're stocking 10 pounds of forage fish that that fish isn't eating. So you take 10 bass out, you just put a thousand pounds of forage in that lake naturally. Gotcha. Right. Yeah, you can correct it with your efforts. I've done it. 
I've I've done it. I've done it in one acre ponds, ten acre ponds, hundred acre lakes. I do an electro fishing boat, but I've done it. So you do something so large though, you would have to have effort. You'd have to have like bass tournaments that are no limit. Every and you're, nothing goes back. Like that's how we did it in those bigger lakes. We would get a bass clubs to come in and do a hundred acre lake and go, look guys, one pounders are on the menu and they're not going back in the water. Whoever brings in the most one pound bass wins this. This is not a big fish tournament. This is a one pound bass tournament. Things like that. We got, we're going to have to get really creative on how to fix this. I want to bring up a scenario that I experienced firsthand and it's in regards to a hundred percent catch and release only fishery, uh, and that was Irvine Lake here in Southern California. And when we first started fishing this place in the mid-2000s, man, it was 50 to 100 fish days or nights some nights. Problem is, dude, it was like seven or eight pounds to win a tur uh, tournament. Yes. And these fish were freaking fragile. And yes. And I honestly think just from our bass fishing pressure, a lot of them died. And what happened over the next like five to six years all of a sudden, we were catching fours, fives, sixes, sevens. A couple double digits came out of there. And I feel like the, the tournament mortality actually uh, helped that lake. Uh-oh. Lost Shan again. He'll be back. But, uh, guys, I got about 10 questions um, queued here that we're going to go over. So keep them coming. Uh, I'm just trying to share my firsthand experiences on the water uh, and, and then bouncing off of bouncing them off of uh, Shan here. Um, I'm learning just as much as you guys are. So appreciate you guys tuning in. Got about 64 of you guys watching right now. I'm back. Shan. All right, man. No, you're oh, good. It's, I don't, StreamYard keeps wanting to make me the of host for some reason or why but i remember while yeah. I was off, we were talking about lure resistance when i lost my train of thought um guys with small ponds and lakes go out and throw every every lure at them um and bass pro shop has and their catch rates plummet and then you go to a pond across the street where nobody fishes and you can just catch them catch them catch them so these bass if you that's what i was talking about if i can train a bluegill to feed let's put it this way if i can train a fish to feed I can train a fish not to feed. Hmm. Right. I think we do a pretty good job of that here in Southern California. I mean, fish we beat the does that. So why does is so how you know? Let's think about it from a lure from a fisherman's perspective. That new hot lure comes out, and you whack them right, and everybody hears about it and goes and gets that. New, how long does it last? I made a career out of it, Shan. I mean, yeah. why do you think I'm throwing a freaking GT <laughs> pencil bait? at these freaking largemouth bass because they've never seen it before yeah. so i get yeah. to benefit from showing these fish something new um and try to circumvent that lure resistance because i know those fish are seeing what's locally popular i literally go into uh these people's backyards all over the country i see what they're all using and i throw something different maybe something similar but different because the last thing I want to do is keep showing them the same bait that's poked them in the face prior, especially with right. these catch and release fisheries. Oh, absolutely. And what I tell my guys that are have pond owners, the private pond owners, and they're going, man, there's something wrong with the lake. I don't catch anything. But I put the shock boat in. There's plenty of nice fish all over 100% relative weight. They look great. And then I go to the bank and I'm like, you got your fish population is fine, dude. I can't catch any. I've thrown every lure of Bass Pro Shop has. And I said, ah, oh, stop doing that. As a matter of fact, leave this lake, go fish somewhere else for about six weeks and then come back and tell me what happens. Let them forget. They can't remember forever, but if you hit them every day, they'll remember. Yeah. The blue that's gills why swim to, to the feeder five minutes before it off. Wow. Yeah. Tell that's me they cool. don't remember. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's some there's some hot info for you guys there. Like honestly, I've found myself trying to force feed a topwater bite um, in like high 50 degree water temps, low 60 degrees if I'm lucky, just because I know I'd be the first idiot to try throwing a topwater uh, anything at these fish. I actually got a frog bite the other day, and I was like, ah, damn, another couple <laughs> degrees, man. I could probably bust their ass because they haven't seen it in months. 
Um, yeah. So it's absolutely something exactly. that I hope exactly. Yep. Yeah, man. All right. Let's talk. Let's let's go over a couple questions here. I've got like a dozen. Um, All right. Uh, the first one is from Anime and Fish, and it's directed towards me. Hey, Oliver, do you think that the PUD has some double digits still, or or will I just waste my time throwing big baits there now? And, uh, Shan, let me give you uh, some background information on this 240-acre little reservoir that I grew up fishing, which I consider my main home body of water. Northern strain only. Mm-hmm. Um but it has always benefited from like really robust and healthy threadfin shad populations and northern strain bluegill, red ear sunfish, and cycles of black crappie that come and go. Uh, obviously, there's a carp spawn every spring that precedes the largemouth spawn. So I've, I've seen small, like shiner sized carp, and actually, we had a a year where uh, golden shiners actually took over the lake. It's a very strange body of water. It seems like every year something cycles to dominate this 240 acre body of water, whether mm-hmm. it's a type of aquatic vegetation or a bait fish. Uh, but they've always had a lot of food and it used to get dude from like October to May on the low end, 1200 pounds of rainbow trout every two weeks. Oh my god! On the, on the high end, twenty seven hundred pounds. So, I mean, it was easy to go and catch a limit of trout through the winter months. So it was fun. I mean, I learned a lot catching trout um, on bait and artificial. But man, it grew a lot of healthy largemouth, and I really caught mm-hmm. just a handful of fish over six and seven pounds. Uh, fishing a traditional bait, jerk bait, crank bait, plastic worm, jig, you name it. When I really dove into the big bait scene, holy crap, a whole new population of fish that I never knew existed showed themselves to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even then, with this overinflated carrying capacity on this 240 acre lake, uh, I have three fish over 10 pounds when all the th- factors were good Mm -hmm. and they haven't been good they've taken those trout plants away for the last five years and just started putting uh like 50 to 150 pound plants a couple years ago like literally like some net fulls like what the hell is the point you guys spent more money in gas to drive those stupid things down here yeah trout in the water it's been very bizarre Mm -hmm. uh But this year, they got more trout than they have the previous three years combined. And I've been on a little bit of a bite on the big Defiant 247, which is that big soft bait that I like to fish. But they're like five, six, almost seven pounds. Um, So, man, the PUD has still still has some nice fish, especially for northerns. But, like, what would you say the likelihood of, of seeing double digits out of this lake are with what I just described okay um it sounds it's good it's running in cycles and it sounds much like the lake that i used to have back home it's 250 acres as well so you're in a you're in a situation again you're in a low bass you're a low bass per acre situation this lake is a cunt of a lake it's hard to catch a fish here Yes. Like someone, someone joked on my Instagram trying to, I think, uh, rile me up. Oh, I'm going to keep every bass I catch out of pudding stone. It's like, good luck, bro. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's probably not too hard to throw a cast net and get some bait, though. So one one thing you touched on, you said it was an elevated carrying capacity. That's not quite. Let me, let me correct you on that. The carrying capacity is the carrying capacity. Okay, the lake, let's say it, it, it's going to hold, Georgia lakes are going to hold, say, 100 pounds of fish per acre on average. As you get to the Midwest, you're probably getting up into the three or 400 pounds of fish per acre. I have no idea about California, plankton density, any of that. So let's just assume that you're on the high end and you're at 400 pounds of fish per acre. Can a lake hold more than that? Yes, it can. Natalie, probably not. 
Um, you would probably have to artificially inflate that carrying capacity with feed or phosphorus in the form of fertilizer coming in. So fertilizer runoff and things like that will elevate your carrying capacity. But your With carrying trout capacity have a similar effect. The trout are you, basically what you're doing is 2,800 pounds of trout going in that thing artificially are just giving the bass that are able to eat them. That's 200 and like divide that by 10. You know, the, each 200, like only five pound plus bass can eat that. Right. Well, those right. trout were also probably between like seven to nine inches. Okay, so a little smaller oh. basket, Billy. Really little, bit so. yeah. But you're still that's primarily like mid range to trophy bass forage. That would be on top of the carrying capacity. But you have to remember those trout are also predators, so they're going to go in there and eat some of your forage bound and and right. adjust that carrying capacity the other way. Okay. Right. And what I would be interested to see is that they were putting that many predators in that lake and stopped. Was that when the gold shiners took over? That's what I would expect. The, the only trout will probably have seasons. I haven't seen one since. It's probably been like 12 or 15 years since I've seen a golden shiner in that lake. They're, they're weird, gone. man. Yeah, they're weird that way. They'll do that. And I don't know why. I've seen that, too. Um, sometimes they'll take it over. And then sometimes they like I've even seen it where we stock them. It's like you stock them and there's golden shiners everywhere. And then the next year they're just gone and they never come back. I, I really don't know why. And generally, if I see them in ponds, it's kind of an indicator. I got a low bass population. I know there's not too many bass. If there's a lot of golden shiner, they usually wipe them out. Gotcha. Okay. Not, but usually. Nice. Yeah. So anime, uh, man, it, when it was good, it was, it was a tall task to catch a double digit out of there. Um, I've done it though. And the biggest one I've seen firsthand that I weighed on a scale with, my, and I saw it with my own eyes and touched it was 1115, which is probably the biggest Northern that I've ever personally seen. Um, but good luck, man. There's still some good ones in there. Hopefully it keeps trending in, in, in that direction. Cause like Greg C has just mentioned, uh, it has been seeing some semblance of stocking for the past three years. Um, but anyways, uh, Flores wants to know that 17 pounder I caught, uh, was that at San or Don Pedro or new Malonis? I guess what 11 years after the fact I could tell you, cause that fish is long gone, but that was a new Malonis fish. Um, and that Shan, that was an interesting dynamic. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the mother load region in like the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas in central California, kind of inland. Mm -hmm. Um, but they've all become dominated by spots. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a problem. But that lake actually kicks out big spots. Like the lake record's uh, almost 11 pounds. Oh, wow. Like big ones. Okay. Um, <laughs> easy. I want to say yeah, they were. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, they, there's kokanee salmon planted as well as the rainbows. Uh, as well as threadfin shad. Um mm -hmm probably the primary uh, forage bases because uh, we catch those spots on like an eight inch, like a uh, HUD catches a lot of big spots, like four to eight pound spots. Uh, the defiant 210 catches a lot of those same class spots. You catch a lot of those big six plus pound spots on like a gang craft 230 glide bait. Um, but I want to say there was a, like a five or six year period prior to me catching that fish where one of the local bass clubs got the okay to plant fingerling Florida strain largemouth. And um, mm. we saw an influx of high teen bass coming out of that lake. Mm. Yeah. I would contribute that to F1 hybrid. Um, when you cross a Northern with a Florida first generation fish is called F1 first generation. Right. Right? Um they'll and it's actually now it's they've separated their bass and florida bass are two different species have you heard that no i haven't they're not calling them sub yeah they're not technically subspecies anymore they're considered two different species and i always thought they should be even though you can't even tell them apart i i you know there's you have to genetically test them to know that um but since you when you cross them they experience hybrid vigor and anything you cross grows better than its parents, right? A hybrid, um, that 
hybrid vigor, and you'll get that out of your Florida and Northern reproduction. Um, those F1s have the excessive growth and, and, and length and, and all the good things you get from a Florida, and they have the aggression of the Northern. So they're a really good mix, and I've stocked them for many years. They grow fantastic. To give you an example, um, I've got F1s in small ponds to 15 and a half inches and three pounds in 11 months. Damn. They're rock and rollers. What What is like the youngest a 10 pounder would probably be? Um, well, I mean, I've seen guys get them in two at the fish hatchery, putting like just like eight bass into a thread finch hat, pond, you know, and just letting them gorge. They look ridiculous. But I would say um, a 25 inch long frame, good relative weight. I'm going to need four years. If you give me a, a, a 10 acre pond in Georgia in four years, I'll get you a 10. Wow. So we could see a pretty quick bounce back. Like by the time I get done being distracted by these bluefin tuna, sand dabs, and sheephead, and all this all saltwater stuff, like our fisheries have the potential to start kicking out some good fish again. Absolutely. The, the ones that dry down, I wanted to touch on that too. Like say you get that natural drought, right? Yep. Well, what happens is, is that air, the soil on the bottom of the lake gets exposed to air and that changes the chemistry. And then you also, for the better, and it also, you get terrestrial weeds growing in that, plants growing in that, right? So when that water floods back in, that's a nutrient source for the phytoplankton. So for the right. next seven years, you'll have an elevated phytoplankton bloom due to the stuff rotting on the bottom. It takes about six or seven years. So again, that's fuel for, to boost the carrying capacity. That's wow. also part of new lake effect. I it's actually literally- saw... I saw a bloom of zooplankton. It looked like small copepods or like, oh yeah, yeah. I don't know what they were. Um, on, on the long term. Yeah, yeah, could be. You can see, uh, yeah, you can see Daphnia with your eyes. Yeah, I was like, oh, that's a good sign. Yeah, definitely. Now I've also noticed the the couple times I've been around to see like these drastic rises in lake levels. Like fishing seems to be off put for that first year. Um, would you say that terrestrial vegetation essentially drowning and dying is affecting that water chemistry to where they're, it's potentially making it uncomfortable for those bass to behave normally? I, I, maybe it just depends on how much rotting vegetation you have. Anything rotting in the water is oxygen consuming. It's tonnage. I mean, I mean, you're talking yeah. about 80 vertical feet of right. bushes and trees and grass and you name it. Like, so there, there definitely could be, you know, some of that action. There also could be a situation too, where, and a lot of, again, got, we, we have already had somebody mention plants before and everybody wants to plants, plants, plants. The worst mistake you can make is putting live plants in your lake. I don't have, I've grown all those fish with, with less than 2% plant growth in my pond. I don't need plant growth to grow big bass. So I, I think good habitat, we're... but it doesn't have to be a plant. Gotcha. So you're an angler and I think uh, people need to know that not only are you uh, an accomplished biologist and not a recreational one, a validated, uh, accredited one. Um, I'm glad we brought that back to the merchandise stream, by the way, available on bigbassstreams.com. Um, but you are an angler and uh, what the hell was I going to talk about uh, and, and, and jump on? Um, I'm sorry. Remind me what the hell we were talking about. Oh, that's all right, man. It'll come back to you. Um, let's see. Uh, we, let's just, I'll just cover this and you keep thinking. Um, okay. Is it too late for California to start your own share lunker program? Absolutely not. Uh, the giant gene is still there. Absolutely is. Again, we're, we're talking genetics before we're talking fish population balance. All right. We need to balance the fish populations and then we can discuss genetics. Okay, we need to get it in the right order. You got to take the first step before you take the second one. You can't jump to the second step. It doesn't matter what the genetics are if there's too many mouths to feed. Exactly. Exactly. And And I've seen it. I'm talking to, I'm speaking from experience. Like guys call me and they say, hey, I want to, I want to grow trophy bass. Okay. I got a 20 acre lake. Okay. I'm going to stock this many bass. I highly discourage you from stocking that many bass, sir. 
But what does he listen to? The fish salesman, not the biologist. And his bass don't grow the way I'm growing bass right now. Um, I've seen that so, so many times. So we've got to get the, the, the population balance correct, and then we can worry about our genetics. Got it. And I do remember my point about the grass. So coming from an angler perspective, okay, I think there's a, a correlation between what we perceive as healthy grass. Let's say hydrilla. I like fishing hydrilla and milfoil because I can work a bait through it, even mm-hmm. open hook bait, like a spinner bait, chatter bait, even a crank bait, because I can clear the bait free of that, that crisp hydrilla. Uh, and it gives us a target that is predictable that we can target as fishermen. So, uh, when they lose that, yes. they're lost. Okay. And I fished a couple of yes. really dynamic grass, historically grass fisheries after the grass was gone. And right. that was Lake Austin in 2014, yep. 15, 16 in Texas. Uh, made the top 10 bass master lakes in the country because they're pumping out share lunkers like mad. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever been there or seen it, but it's a 27-mile dam stretch of the lower Colorado River, Shan, with little to no current. Oh, wow. Time. So it's just a big river channel. Now you got, like, hydrilla growing from both banks to where, like, there was barely, like, a narrow boating channel. Um, and That's guys, bad. It, it was bad, but it also was good because it, it made it, like, easier Easy. to fish in the oh, aspect sure. They could only fish the edge or the holes. Right. Okay. Right. And yep. uh, long story short, rich homeowners, uh, bitch moan, blah, blah, blah. They dumped like 27 tons of grass carp in. Yeah. And like six months later, there was, I've never seen a <laughs> of aquatic yeah. vegetation in that lake. Right. So when I showed up, being from California, like a lot of times, I would stop throwing the big bait once grass started growing because we got what I call pita grass. And that's just a pain in the ass grass. It's a long, stringy, uh, strong grass that you can't really clear your bait through. It's a pain in the ass to fish through. Yeah. Uh, the fish use it. Um, so when I came to, to, to Texas, I was like, oh, man, this place is dope. I could throw my big bait all the time and not have to deal with this pain in the ass grass that I haven't used to back in California. And, you know, I went to what I know, so I fished a lot of rock, and I fished other types of cover, Mm -hmm. and I busted their asses when a lot of the locals are, like, sending me, like, uh, you know, passive-aggressive comments, like, oh, man, you're two years too late, and blah, 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 and I'm like, you know, these fish are stupid, like, I'm busting their asses. Yes, like yeah well you're I, I say this all the time and you're kind of you're helping me prove it so let's again let's back it up let's rewind back to our little pond okay it's easier and this is something that directly applies okay so let's say i have grass carp in my pond because the pond is an irrigation system for a commercial facility that grows trees they're just kind enough to allow me to grow some bass in it right but if I allow that pond to get more than 30% coverage in weeds, okay, weeds are alive. They're plants, right? So they produce oxygen in the daytime and they use it at night. That 30% is the breaking point for your fishery. If your fishery gets more than 30% covered, it starts negatively impacting the bass population. Bass begin to lose weight because the bait fish have too many places to hide and the bass can't hunt them. Secondarily, if it does, if they don't starve the bass that way, the other thing, it depends on the plant really, but the other thing that can happen is the bass fry that are born can't be preyed on because there's so many weeds. And then those bass fry just clean house in those weed beds. And when those weeds go away, you're stunted out with bass to hell and back. Mm. And I know because I've treated lakes. I've watched. Here's what happens. The lake gets weeds. Everybody thinks the weeds are good for the lake. And then it gets so bad that they can't fish. So I go treat the weeds, get rid of them, put the grass carp in, maybe do a treatment, get rid of them. But that's probably been like three years or so. And the fish population's out of bounds. 
balance, the weeds are gone, the guy's in again, and the fishing's all messed up, and who gets blamed? Well, that, the that makes me the biologist, you screwed it up, you messed it all up. <laughs> no, 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 you guys messed it up when you let the weeds choke it out. If you want to, if you don't believe me, go Google biological oxygen demand. Okay, if you let the weeds get too thick, what uh, happens? Is night, read? They talk, they take all the oxygen out of the water and kill your fish. I'm I'm smiling here. So here you can't just leave a weed problem. <laughs> <laughs> this conversation, so exactly what you described is yeah. This conversation brings You're me back right. to my first interaction with you, Shan. And, you know, yeah. I come home off the road traveling and I'm looking forward to fishing my pain in the ass 24, uh, 240 acre lake pudding stone because I revel in the fact that it's so damn hard to catch a fish there, but I could come there and have consistent success. And I felt like it kept me uh, sharp and it kept me from getting soft because I'm traveling to other places in the country where I feel like fishing is a little easier in many regards. So it's important for me to come home and still like, uh, feel like I got to work for a bite and I came home and was like super excited to launch my kayaks with my buddy and as we're about to launch there comes a tin boat spraying what looked like <laughs> copper sulfate down the bank and it I was probably chelated it was probably chelated copper not sulfate biologists <laughs> we know I, I, don't, I don't use CUSO4 neither do they man that stuff's bad okay well, it was just like bright blue it's coming yeah. out like Two streams, both sides, like coming down the freaking cove. And I'm just like, are you freaking kidding me right now? And I made a little rant Instagram post. And uh, it's, someone might have tagged you in it or something. But that yeah. was the first oh. time I saw you pop up in my world. And yeah. this is what I appreciate about you, Shan. Like, like you know, you keep a little chip on your shoulder and you tell it how it is. And, uh, you know, you're like, oh, this is bullshit. You guys are always quick to call call bullshit on the biologist and you know, <laughs> scenario or something along those lines. And uh, I mean, I learned to embrace the grass on that lake. Yeah. And once again, as an angler, I knew how I could target it effectively. And uh, if you take that away, when you're used to that dynamic, it could be a struggle. And like my man, Sean just said, uh, Candlewood Lake in Connecticut was one of another lake that had that similar dynamic, heavy, healthy grass fishery, uh, 25 to high 20 pound mixed bags of smallmouth and largemouth in Connecticut. Uh, wow. Trout planted, Alawife wow. Lake, those guys lost their minds because they learned how to fish that lake with grass. And when I show up, mm -hmm. I find a couple small patches of it. But once again, like I'm used to fishing lakes without grass as well. And uh, I could go out there and literally take a smaller version of this saltwater bait. Uh, actually, I've caught them really good on that body of water, throwing a 40-gram cast OG. That thing uh, is money, dude. Dude, it's been so much fun to fish. Uh, but I was throwing it way offshore, like off those first breaks off main lake humps and points where I could see these alawife on my sonar. Uh, and this is how I'm I'm utilizing forward-facing sonar is to locate mm -hmm. where the bait presence is. Yeah. And seeing like, oh, most of that's like off of that 20 foot, 30 foot break. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually sitting uh way off the break or way shallow, so I can throw that thing like far. I don't even know, like probably 200 feet. Um, and target those pelagic roaming smallies and largemouth hunting these open water alawife. And I showed a couple mm -hmm. of the local guys there this bite that I discovered. And, dude, it was like saltwater bass, like wolf pack action. They had never seen this presentation. And, like, dude, I was having, like, two to five pounds smallmouth and largemouth taking turns trying to eat this thing in the middle of the day. Nice. And, but it was just another example of a few things we've talked about tonight. Uh, right? The lure fatigue. Um showing them something new, but also targeting targeting them in a way at, with the absence of the aquatic vegetation. It, I don't yes. know if it and really what results. What you're saying. Oh, sorry. Go, break. Uh, go, yeah, sorry about that, man. Um, what you're saying is closely resembles what I've observed in uh, my electrofishing. 
The grass is still there. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. You keep breaking in and out a little bit. I don't know if it's on my end or your end. Um, yeah, you're break you're breaking in and out on me as well. Hmm. Just a touch. I think it, it might be both, but um when the grass goes away and I do my electrofishing surveys, the fish didn't go away. Removing the grass doesn't kill the fish. It makes them harder to catch. Right. Gotcha. I mean, I think Lake Conroe in the, um, oh, like Houston area, Texas, may be the only lake that I know of that was that same scenario. It was a heavy grass lake and never really kicked out the same magnitude of fish once it was gone. Yep. Um, I've seen that. But anyways, um, let's move on to the next question. I got more questions. We're going to be here until like freaking Friday at this rate. Um, <laughs> yeah, appreciate you guys sticking with us. Uh, uh, Jed Dickerson jumps on with us. He's probably still clapping for cheerleading. Um, this is an interesting question from Derek O. Is there a way to try uh, to out weights of fish in different sections of a lake say north versus south end or is it strictly it is what it is and no human intervention can affect it and i could see this being a really relevant question on a body of water like lake berryessa in northern california one of my favorite lakes uh i would guess it's probably 20 miles in length north to south so like i can target the beginning onset of the pre-spawn in the very north part of the lake and just kind of follow it as it progresses down through the southern portions of the lake. Now, I've, I've read some studies on, like, movement and, uh, like, migration or lack of with largemouth and smallmouth. I, I think this is pertaining to his question. Like, can you have a, a real effect on a specific portion of a lake through selective harvest? Um, I don't think so. It's, it's, it's more like the whole lake, you know, you, you can't just take you know, Not that fish don't stay in, in sections of the lake and live their whole life there. They absolutely do. But as you remove a fish, remember that there'll be another fish there. It's recruitment to take its place. So that's what your biologist was telling you. He doesn't care if you keep the six pound bass, it's already reached its potential pull that fish out of the way. So like a younger three pound fish that has the potential to get to 10 can, can climb up. Um, so no, not really, but you can definitely see that, you know, you've heard people say river fish all the time, but generally the rivers will be and the fish will be a different color. Their bodies will shift color depending on the water clarity. So fish on the South end of the lake will be clear clear water will be that green with the black sides normally look real like normal you pull the same fish in muddy water it'll shift its color to almost straight chrome and it'll shift back once the water clears back up so you can tell what part of the lake the dude was fishing in if you've got stained water coming in the top and clear water at the end you know, fish came from the silver bass came out of that muddy water and the green ones came out of the clear nice Awesome. All right, let's keep moving on here. Uh, big shout out to one of the OGs, Ralph Holiday. Uh, he just made the observation at one of our lakes, which isn't really open to public access anymore, I don't think. But it was one of the lakes that never got trout stockings, but he got a fish to 13 pounds. 13 pounds. Sure, good balance, that's all. Gotcha. Bound. You don't have to have trout. The trout help. But you don't have to have them. You can get it. There's no, there was no, there was no trout in the, in the lake. My friend called that 13 pound bass in Georgia either. Gizzard shed, but no trout. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is that lake I fished yesterday. And one of the lakes that I talked about with that 2,103 fish survey has had an influx of gizzard shad over the last decade. Yeah. And we got a buddy catching them um, offshore uh, around schools of like five to eight inch gizzards. And they're a thousand percent gizzards. They got like mm -hmm. that blunt rounded nose. But I'm also seeing like mega gizzards like running around the boat. Uh, yeah. Do these, these these look like 20 inch gizzard shad? Yeah. Uh, and I think the That's biggest one I've ever seen is like 24 inches out of the Great Lakes. 
Wow. Dude, we measured them. Like we were chasing around on live scope thinking they were brown trout for hours. Right. <laughs> and then one actually like snagged itself. <laughs> we we're like, what the hell? Dude, that's a giant God, gizzard no. shad. Um so well that's that's a great way to tie back into the carrying capacity conversation that we had. That's the problem with gizzard shad. If they get into a lake, let's let's use my hundred hundred pounds of fish breaker. I've got a 10 acre pond. That means I can support a uh, thousand pounds of fish, right? I get gizzard shad in there and I don't and there's a caveat. I don't have any 10 pound. I don't have, I got a stunted bass population, nothing, no bass to eat the shad, right? I don't have it. They're just not there. So what happens is that that thousand pounds of fish, those shad start to re reproduce, reproduce, reproduce. They're 16, 18 inches long. Let's say we have 600 pounds of shad now, two years later, that means we have 400 pounds of game fish. The shad will displace does that make sense? Yeah. Now, if you have does. if you have a large bass population of big healthy bass that can eat those big shad, that won't happen to you. But if you've got a stunted bass population, it absolutely will. And those shad will just bump, bump those, just kind of crowd those fish out. And I've seen that in ponds. We have to drain them and start them over because it's ninety percent shad and ten percent game fish. You can't fix it. They're all eighteen inch shad. Yeah. So you just got to wipe, it, start it over. The only hope I have for this lake is that there's stripers in it too, which I'm surprised that we're not seeing like 20 and 30 pound class stripers coming out of it with that much um, biomass of gizzard shad. Like, dude, I yeah. saw clouds of them oh, uh, yeah. yesterday of the smaller size. And then I'd see like dozens at a time of like the bigger ones. And then I'd see like two or three of those mega ones. So yeah. with each other. I got a yeah, good tip for you. Um, so the fact that you're seeing small gizzard shad is a good sign because because of the there's <laughs> because they're so good at overcrowding and destroying the lake the way I just described it, their bodies release a pheromone into the water that shuts down reproduction. Huh. So if you see shad reproduction, you know that pheromone's not in the water and you know they're not stunted out. Interesting. See, learn something new every day from you, man. That's cool. Um, big shout out to my man, Albert Salas. Uh, I actually just got a message on my Instagram DM from my man, Jim, from uh, New Jersey. He was listening to a podcast. I think your cousin, Bert, did. And uh, he dropped my name um, in it a couple of times. So tell him I said, what's up, man? I appreciate the love. Uh, thanks for the kind words, Brian Heiselman. Uh, lots going on, man. I apologize for not having more content on this platform. Um, let's see. Daniel Shelton made a comment. I was thinking about the fish care from back then. We probably killed a lot of the giants by not fizzing them properly and keeping them in our live wells too long, plus a lack of trout plants and droughts. Now, Shan, I feel like the, the tournament mortality might have been like helpful in some of these cases right like that was really the only culling of bass yeah, it wasn't you know? enough to keep them from right and and i think too the bass um there's probably a perception of mortality a higher perception of mortality than actually occurred bass are really tough, tough. Yeah. yeah they're really really they're too tough actually for their own good we would be better off if they were a little more sensitive and died in a starved condition and then when they all died people would figure out what we've done to them with catch and release but um let's is there a scientific is there like a scientific measurement of how much hardier a largemouth is than a northern smallmouth because those things are fragile yeah it's a different fish it's a um a cold water fish um and so it kind of resembles a trout, right? Yeah, is, yeah, a totally. Little, a little more. Got a and it's like, ah, it's yeah, a little bit easier. Four ounces. <laughs> yeah. No, largemouth bass are like freaking Debo, man. You can't kill them. They just, they just, they ain't dying. <laughs> They're yeah. too tough. But what this guy said, though, about the live wells, let's touch on that. And let's talk, touch sure. a little on handling. Um, okay. Okay. So I like, I like a net. Um, I don't, I especially don't really like to suspend bass over 10 pounds by the jaw. 
I like to support their belly with my other hand, support their in internal organs with your other hand, wet your hands. You want wet hands anytime you touch a fish. You can peel the slime coat off. Um, once you peel the slime coat off, you, that slime protects the fish from the bacteria in the water. So that's how those bacteria infections get in there. Another way to do it, like he said, if you leave them in the live well too long and they, they pee a lot, they get stressed out and that ammonia will cause them to drop their slime coat. And I know you've seen it in bait tanks when the water turns to slime, they've dropped their slime coat off and then your bait isn't very hardy anymore. Same thing happens to your bass, leaving them in the live well. Flush the water. Um, adding a little bit about a cup of salt to your live well will help. That aids in what's called osmoregulation. It's really no different than a runner taking in electrolytes. So you said um, a cup of salt? Yeah, about one cup of salt okay. in, in your live well. Because what's the live well typically, like around 30 gallons or something, yeah. would you say? Yeah. Something That's a like safe point. You can't really 20, mess that up. Like, you, 20, How much is too much salt? Oh, well, you don't, um, like a 200 gallon tank, I would put them in a pot, just like a standard pot that you would use to boil water. That's what you would put 200 in a 200 gallon haul tank, you know, um, probably like a five quart pot. So like I said, half a cup, a cup, just a little bit of rock salt, not iodized salt either. Don't use iodine. It's bad. For okay. Water. I was about to ask um, that. Use road salt or rock salt, cheap salt, um, or any of the products that they sell for that. You know, that's okay. salt with a uh, slime for tote and a little bit of dye. But all those products I support, you know, any of those things you want to add to the water, that's going to help. What happens is, is that peeing, uh, when they get stressed, drops their electrolyte level. And it can stress them and kill them. So the salt will go back in through their gills. And that's what osmoregulation is, the internal salt balance. So you're giving them back some electrolytes that they're peeing out from being stressed in the tank. Got it. That's great information. Um, here's a question I want to ask you uh, for myself. Now, you talk about relative weight of these fish and, and people misdiagnosing them as being post-spawn or stress from spawn. If you have a 25-inch bass that has the potential to be 10 pounds with good relative weight, but it's severely underweight, like it's 6 or 7 pounds, does that fish have any hope of rebounding to being above relative weight with the right conditions, or is that thing too far gone, and is it a candidate for removal and harvest that far down that would be a candidate for removal that's it's 25 inches long it's lived its life you know it's and it's pounds underweight okay so let's let's describe this in, in a healthy fishery i do it all the time every spring i do this so your female bass start out Let's say they start out at 100% relative weight. So at 24 inches, that bass is perfect at 8.1. That'll give me 100% relative weight on a 24-inch on a bass. Okay, so that's my goal as a manager. That fish begins to feed, and I've seen this dozens, hundreds of times, in a healthy fishery. That 24-inch fish, fish will be 10 pounds before the spawn because of the egg weight. But after the spawn, it'll drop back down to its healthy weight of 8.1 again. It bulks up for the spawn, right? It's not growth. It's not an inch longer. It's egg weight. The energy that it's consuming isn't making the bass bigger. It's making the bass heavier because of the eggs that are in its body. Right. So if it started out at 6 pounds and now it's – full of eggs at eight pounds and it's hundred percent relative weight, it's going to drop that egg weight and go back down to that six pounds and that unacceptable way, unacceptable range. Right. So that is what egg weight means. And guys mess that up all the time. If you, if you're holding a bass, that's a pound under standard weight and calling it spawning stress, you don't understand egg weight. Gotcha. Because I've noticed through years of fishing them through the spawning period uh even though i'm targeting pre-spawn fish over a three-month span over the different waves of fish that come up uh, you start seeing these 
post spawn looking fish being more aggressive feeding on these big like top water and hard baits in may and june for me yeah and man they're kind of these giant wind socks right right and i always just assume like damn like she's just gone through the process she's stressed out and now she's hungry i mean that seems to be the kind of general consensus uh portrayed throughout fishing media is that not accurate yeah, I would, I would want the math behind it. You know, give me some relative weights. Where did she start? Where did she end? Generally, if it's a windsock, she started out poor anyway. Yeah, I, I guess we're we're under underprepared to really figure that out, right? Because maybe that's the only time we catch her, so we don't know where she started. Um, right. All I right. know is, but you should see what you'll see though is general trends, like. Um, it, it, it's very rare, like every once in a while, like in my pond, the smallest relative weight I've seen is 99%. No, I take that back. One fish did bad. One fish probably had some kind of tag issue or something yeah. and <laughs> didn't grow. Yeah, they got pit. That one got pitched. But aside <laughs> from that one fish, we've had one bass under 100% relative weight, 99. Everything else has been 100 to 146%, like, like ridiculous, right? So, Lakes that produce good fish will consistently pr produce high relative weight bass of any size. So if you show me a two pound bass, that's 115% relative weight. I know that fish is going to go to four. It's too big at two. It's got plenty to eat. Does that make sense? Yeah. Gotcha. All right. They'll all look like footballs or they're all all like wind socks generally. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I seem to see the wind sock uh, scenario pretty much on Florida uh, genetic bodies of water or ones mm -hmm. that have a mix of Florida genetics. Like, seems like the northern strains seem to hold that gully weight a little bit better throughout the summer months, even. That's why I honestly like fishing pudding zone. Those fish look good all year round for the content. Mm hmm. I would attribute too. that more to probably the balance of the. Are you seeing that in the same lake or different lakes? Different, like different lakes with northerns, like pyramid fish. Yeah, I would attribute I would that, that more. To that the same. northern lake is has a better balance than the Florida lake. I wouldn't contribute that to genetics. Okay, so there might just be some circumstantial um, observation there on my end. Like, I live in Florida by Robin Reservoir. I, I check the relative weights, everything I catch. I haven't caught one down there under 100% relative weight. Wow. They I'm curious good. to see where, if that holds true through like May and June, because they'll definitely be into their summer uh, patterns by then. Yeah, yeah. I was even last fall, yeah, last fall before, like in the summertime, jerkbait bomb down there um i haven't seen any unhealthy fish they all look they're all like 100 199 100 101 102 all right there um look solid gotcha and i've seen that a lot at clear lake as well like during the summer months every fish under five pounds will just be footballs like you'd mm -hmm. be sad. you'd be like what the hell like this thing's relative weight is insane mm -hmm. um, i don't know what the hell is in that water but those fish feel heavy for their size even with that girth um, but you'd catch one from like six to nine pounds and it'd have that windsock effect. Now that's really a that's very really interesting. Weight. Yeah. That's a, very, yeah, that is... it's crazy, man. I've huh. never seen schools of hundreds of bass. Like I find at that lake at times, like hundreds. Right. And now right. it's been verified with forward facing sonar. I'm like, Oh my freaking God, if these are bass, and we'll sit there on a school and make the same cast on, on special days and catch like 130. Like it's nutty, but we also right. have now, also remember my my pers my perspective is from smaller bodies of water. Larger bodies of water will have these not natural cycles, you know, that are different. Smaller bodies of water tend to get stuck and stay there. Larger bodies of water tend to have like a cyclic kind of thing, you know. But like you mentioned, the the lakes that were spotted bass introduced, uh -huh. those aren't going to cycle. The spotted bass will take those where you can kiss a large mouth to bottom that place you'll always have a few 
but I've seen it too many times in Georgia. Spots will outcompete them. They'll breed with they'll breed with small mouths. Oh, we got those. Small mouths, right? Yeah, we call them smots. Yeah, yeah. So that breeding will the spotted bass is a genetic gene, and it'll breed the the small mouth right out of the lake. Yeah, we've seen that on Berryessa, Don Pedro, a lot of those lakes that had established smallmouth and spotted populations. Now, thankfully, uh, a lot of the bass fishing community in the West Coast has come to the realization that keeping spotted bass is beneficial because eventually they just get tired of catching five fish for eight to 12 pounds. Yeah. Uh, you can catch 50 to 80 clones, and it's just one spot after another. Yeah, now, that's the with them. The aversion to killing largemouth, I think, is going to be met with the same kind of energy with smallmouth. Because those northern smallmouth boys love those fish. Now, uh, fishing with Stingray Drew here wants to know, does this same concept of harvesting fish, I'm assuming, apply to, to smallmouth? I, I, it would in a, in, a, in a lake, but river systems are different. They're way more dynamic. They're even more com dynamic and complex and have way more issues than, a, you know, a big reservoir. Um, because they generally run into the coast and you get the, you get fish that migrate into the river. That's what I like about Rodman. We get migrations of mullet and pogies and threadfin that come up the barge canal that aren't associated with the biomass of the lake. Gotcha. And those lakes, those lakes are unique. You probably got that in the Delta too, where you get runs of things from the coast. All kinds of crap. All, yeah, <laughs> all those forage fish coming in. That that is different. That that does boost their capacity temporarily in the springtime. You see what I'm saying? That's yeah. a diff, completely different scenario than what we were describing. It's another one of those variables that we have to factor in. Sounds like the herring run in Massachusetts. Where those yeah, guys thing. see you run herring into these yeah, tiny. Yeah, I saw a guy comment thirteen pound bass up there too. Yeah, I was, I've been meaning to get to that. That's wild. Yeah, yeah. That's a big ass fish, let alone in Boston. Don't <laughs> tell me, Northern State. <laughs> yeah, I mean the biggest ones that I know of, like Santa Margarita Lake uh, in Central California, is all Northerns, and I think that lake record's like fourteen plus pounds. Um, yeah. Like, they can get pretty big. I don't know if I know of one over 15. Mm, I, that's rare for anything. You know, that's... um. I mean, that's rare for a Florida street fish, really, these days especially. That, yeah, it really is. I mean, I, Orange Orange Lake uh, west of me is, is kind of doing an OHIV. It almost dried up, and a dude pulled a 15 out of there last summer, but that was the only one I heard that heavy. Gotcha. But you would love Orange, man. Full of hydrilla. Oh, uh, it it was on my my list of targets uh, when when we were looking to spend more time in Florida for sure. I mean, I do my yeah. basic research of what bodies of water are kicking out trophy potential fish. Then it's a matter of going in there and Orange. trying to peek that pu unique puzzle. And that was yeah. one of them. So, yeah. all right, next question, my man Jake Wingate, who got to see firsthand how damn hard it is to catch a bass in California. Uh, but he did love the, the scenic uh, views, and uh, I, I definitely was successful in changing at least one person's perspective on California. And I know there's a lot more of you guys out there that like to shit on my home state. But, man, this is a special place, and don't get it twisted. Uh, I've been having a blast showing people like Jake uh, the, all the dope things about this part of the country but uh, he wants to know uh, what point does prey become predator and uh, it sounded like 16 inches was that threshold yeah if we're talking about bass now of course like shad don't become predators they are filter feeders they feed plankton zooplankton scrapers they'll scrape the detritus and get you know food off of that so you can have a 24 inch shad but it's not a predator it's still forage it's yeah. just, I think he was in uh, asking in regards to largemouth. Okay, so in, lar in, in that frame that way, yeah, that 16-inch fish is the point at which you really start to see them get predatory on other bass. But also remember, like, when you pick bass up at the hatchery, you can look into the tank and watch them eat each other. 
And I'm not talking about one or two. I'm talking about when I picked up my bass, I watched 15 bass eat other bass in the tank. They, they don't care. There's no love. Anything that fits in my mouth is going down. Brother, sister, cousin. And if they swim by their mama, she'll light their up. Right. <laughs> right. It's survival of the fittest. So for that reason, when I'm doing electro fishing surveys, I don't even worry about what's head bass and below. They're forage. They're not going to make it. Think about it this way. You catch a 10 inch bass, right? You pick him up on a trap. Boom, you pull your yo-yo on a trap. It hits it. You reel it in. It feels like a dead sweat sock. It's a 10-inch bass. You put that fish back. I bet that fish doesn't live a half an hour. It's tired. It's too small. It's smoked. Something's going to come find him and dust him up. That's cool. That's cool. That uh, reaffirms my uh, my fondness of small bass pattern baits. And, uh, man, it's funny because, like, well, that's <laughs> – once again, like that, that irrational love we all have for these bass can transcend uh, and manifest itself into some crazy like trains of thought. Like my boy Carnell, uh, aka Dimension, who I grew up fishing with, just could not wrap his head around the fact that a bass would eat another bass because he loves those damn fish as much as anybody does. And, you know, until I put a, a Matt Lures bass glide in his hands at Clear Lake when there was a ton of these like six to eight inch bass everywhere. Like if you threw a regular bait, you couldn't get away from those things. And a big fish smoked it. He's mm -hmm. sitting he really had issues with it. He was I can't believe they would do that to each other. And I'm like, bro, like, <laughs> yeah. like I don't understand how this idea got in your head. Like you've yeah. been watching me do a baby bass Zara spook since ninety-eight. Like, to put it in, I know, right? To put it in human terms, it would work like this. All right, you have a baby. Your baby goes to first grade. One kid is coming out of first grade. They're going to fight to the death. So if your kid gets killed in first grade, go have another one. Good luck to it. Yeah. The second grade, the kid that goes to the second grade, guess what? He's going to fight to the death too. And to go to third grade, he's going to have to be, he's going to have to kill every kid in third grade. Only one of them's going. No, it's, 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 pretty mind-blowing to, to think of the numbers that an adult fish even at legal 12 inch size like what that poor bastard had to go through to even reach that point in its life like i don't ever want to come back as anything in the underwater environment because they're everything's trying to kill you it's that's exactly right like it's wild man uh, great observation by alexander we i think we all need to apologize to the bucket brigade over the years myself included uh you know those guys are definitely keeping those numbers in check whether we realize them or not all throughout those decades of us being uh infiltrated by giant bass uh and and i don't see that anymore and it's Probably because of all the bullshit they had to deal with from guys like me. Like, hey, throw that thing back, or you know, you should catch and release that thing. Uh, you know, eventually people just get tired of assholes. So uh, apologies on my behalf, uh, firsthand to anybody that I might have uh, given that energy. Uh, man, come back, bring your buckets, Yeti buckets, uh, are right. great. Bass well, in. <laughs> think about this way too, man. Imagine you walk into the grocery store. And you see wild caught organic fish fillets. How much? What's the price tag on that? Dude, so we have a chain of Asian supermarkets here in Southern California. It's 99 Ranch Market, and they've got live seafood. Uh, and for years now, they've had largemouth in the tank alive. Mind you, uh, they're, they're farm raised. They're literally all clones, the exact same size, same shape. They're all eating the same amount of food, right? right. But any, anybody that gets a wind of this is like standing there in shock as an angler. Uh, and dude, they're getting like 15 or 18 or 99 farm raised. I don't, I don't know how they're making a profit. They would have to be tremendously expensive just for the conversion factor. You got to feed them so much. Right. Fifteen to eighteen ninety nine a pound is what they normally get. That ain't well, cheap. That's what you're throwing back. Yeah, that's a meal, man. So if you start looking at, and especially as food prices keep going up, you're throwing out free food, man. 
No, seriously. And dude, even what I did last night, like, do I still got some really good eating saltwater fish in my freezer that I need to get yeah. through? Um, I don't mind eating bass occasionally. It can actually be very good. Yeah. Uh, surprisingly good. Uh, but I had the intent of killing this fish to, you know, perpetuate this growth of, of bigger bass on our local lakes. But I also knew I wasn't going to eat it. So I threw it in the oven to feed the dog. And like, I mean, I feel really good about feeding this stupid little furball that I love uh, tremendously. Like clean protein. That's better than that crap pre-made processed dog food that we all buy at the store. Like I don't feel bad about yeah, killing man. that fish at all in that regard. Like, I've got. A, a, you know, a... Go if ahead. You, um, if you um, don't want to eat them. Take them and put them um, by any plants. Just bury them by any plants that you want to grow in your garden or in your yard. Uh, fish are incredible fertilizer. You will absolutely blow away every community with the growth on your rose bushes or hydrangeas or whatever it is you like to grow. Put a few fish around that joker and watch what happens. Can you do that with like a whole fish, like a one pound bass yeah. and just throw it down yeah. there and bury it? Good. Throw it in the hole. Yeah, good to go. Best for that's, that's kind of what I liked about the whole dog food approach. Like I didn't have to spend any more time cleaning this stupid thing or the mess associated with it. I literally just put it on some aluminum foil and threw it in their hole because I knew I could just peel the meat off of it, uh, pick away all the bones, and then just wrap it up. And it doesn't, it didn't stink. Um, it was easy to 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 manage mess wise because. I mean, that's one of the things I hate about keeping fish at times, right? These days are long enough. There's enough crap for me to do. Last right. thing I want to do is deal with a freaking stinky, bloody, slimy mess. Clean the um, fish. Yeah, that sucks. Mm -hmm. right. All right. Does culling follow the same line as lakes going through natural stages as well with the lifespan of fish allowing for more or less forage? Is culling just a way to speed up that process? I think it's a way to balance that process. Like everybody's making the assumption that these lakes balance naturally. Like mother nature is going to take care of it. But I mean, every lake I've ever managed was man-made. How is mother nature going to take care of a man-made environment? Does mother right. nature come mow, mow your grass? Nope. So all of these stocking strategies were developed by scientists from man-made lakes a hundred years ago. They put a bunch of fish in there, filled it up, watched what happened, drained it down. That didn't work. Put another combination of fish. That didn't work. And through trial and error, they figured out, like in ponds, bass and bluegill. That's the two best fish you can have in a pond. You need a few shellcracker to control the parasites. I like a few grass carp to control the plants. But other than that, bass and bluegill. That's all I got growing 4.65 and 17 grow months of growing just bluegill, but it, because it's the right balance. The forage is irrelevant to me. I don't care if my bass are eating shad, shiner, uh, bluegill, blah, 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 and they list off, off a bunch of more bait fish or just straight bluegill. I don't care. I need that fish to eat 10 pounds to gain one pound. The forage it eats is irrelevant. Got it. If it doesn't gain one pound, it didn't eat 10 pounds. And they're so ferocious, that tells me the 10 pounds isn't there for them to eat. Gotcha. Okay. All right. My man Flores wants to know, hey, man, I'm glad you uh, hopefully didn't unfollow me on Instagram and stuck around and joined us on this live stream. I appreciate all you guys having that open mindset. Uh, I think we all want the same thing uh, as far as uh, people that watch this channel and uh, participate in it. So appreciate you guys. Uh, how about they change the limit? Right now, it's 15 inches or bigger can be taken home. Why not change that to 10 inches and below? He's having a hard time. Mm -hmm. understand what you're saying. Well, again, 10 inches and below, I'm not worried about. Uh, the slot limit that I've looked at, it's probably the 12 to 14, 12 to 15. That's probably where you're going to need to be. But you can, he's great. He, Flores brings up an excellent point. Politics 
makes the rules, not science. The science, if, if everybody voting wants catch and release, catch and release is what's happening, whether it's good for the lake or not, because you, you votes are what counts and bureaucracy makes the rules. The science, Scientists just report to the politicians. The politicians have to change the rules. So I've seen that plenty of times. I'm talking about private water where I can go out there with an electro fishing boat and take as many out as I want at one time. You can't do that at a public lake. You have regulations. So even though we know, hey, we should be removing these fish, but they're all under the slot, we can't, there's nothing you can do about it. You're stuck. You have to go talk to the, you have to go through the red tape now and figure that out. You know, go get the biologist and, Go to the meetings and do all that kind of jazz. Yeah, uh, I've been having conversations with DFW employees, try, just trying to understand the landscape. And, man, it's going to be daunting to have any real effect uh, on policy uh, or management going forward. But I know I'm going to give it a freaking concerted effort because uh, I do miss this being – the base of trophy bass fishing culture. It, uh, it makes me kind of cringe uh, when I see Texas kind of really embracing that role. And they're doing an, great. They really are. They're, they're doing an incredible job. And I feel like we, we grew what we grew pretty much accidentally. If there was a little bit of effort put towards that, like we could be back on top of that game. And I don't have to freaking drive thousands of miles and dodge hurricanes <laughs> and tornadoes and hailstorms and uh, get asked what part of Mexico I'm from and eat terrible food. Uh, it's It's been good to be home except for the absence of big bass. Um, so right. hopefully, hopefully we can uh, have a, a small effect, uh, but cumulatively a, a powerful one. Um, if we can embrace some of these new ideas. All right. My man, Sean place wants to know, uh, would removing all grass in the lake and adding 30,000 carp hurt a lake. And he's probably talking about candlewood. Um, are, are we talking grass carp or? Yeah. Yeah. He's talking grass carp. Grass carp. Well, again, I've seen this a bunch of times. If you add the carp, I mean, 30,000 is grass carp. That must be a huge lake. Um, it's not going to hurt the lake. It's not going to change the balance of the fishery very much. It will change where the bass set up. Like Oliver said, the hydrilla will choke the bass out to the edge. So they can hunt. They're, they're going to hunt that edge. And a big poor population of the bass are going to be sitting on that hydrilla edge but when you remove that edge they're going to go find other habitat to hunt around and that brings up another point that i wanted to touch on earlier um like a guy like oliver who knows where to go catch a 17 knows where to go catch these trophy fish right well i'm not that good a fisherman but i did have an electro fishing boat so i know where they were too and i could go find them and when you shock a lake for 15 years in a row, you're like, get ready on the front because the big's fixing to come and bop, there's the nine, there's the nine and a half, there's the seven, there's the eight, all in the same spot. Every single year, you can just tell the guy on the front of the boat because those big fish habitat is like a convenience store. It's easy food. That's why they're there. They're having the easiest time finding meals right there. And since they're the biggest in the lake, like I said, Debo, you're leaving. You're either going to run away or I'm going to eat you, but this is my spot. That's why those holes produce consistently like that. So when your holes stop producing consistently, you know there's a problem. You know, I know there's a problem when I keep asking these like young protégés and interns uh, if they would even know who Debo is. And I'd be like, have you ever seen <laughs> Friday, Friday? Right? <laughs> or have you ever seen Boys in the Hood? Or have right. you ever seen just all these like classic iconic movies uh, Don't even from know. our generation, oh, man? They have no idea. They've never seen it. Like, dude, we were sitting at Candlewood at this kids' camp, and I made these like twenty somethings watch Bloodsport, and oh, they're wow. just like, I'm like, 
how do you guys not love this movie? This is like the greatest like fight movie ever. <laughs> and uh, man, that, that just makes me laugh. Um, that's shout right, out Michael. It's my bike now, punk. <laughs> yeah, that's right. If anybody has never seen Friday, do yourselves a damn favor and go watch right? that. Well, those um, bass say, that's my stump now, punk. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, our man Cali Bass Kid says he knew a guy named Ken, and he's referring to Ken Matthews, who lived in Covina. And I used to sit in his garage as he hustled uh, different variations of these four and six inch straight tail hand poured uh, worms. Man, that guy was a salesman. Um, and his company was called Lifelike Plastics, indeed. And although he said he caught a 14 bass out of Pudding Stone, Cali Bass Kid. Ken was also the guy that you just watched launch his boat 10 minutes ago and come around the corner and say, Hey Ken, how you doing? And he had this crazy uh, thunder shake technique of his Texas rig worm. Like he literally would move that rod tip like three to five feet with every shake. Wow. Um, and he'd be like, Oh, I got about 27 and just keep going down the bank. And we're looking at each other like, yeah, freaking right, bro. So, um, yeah. Uh, all right, 10 Peter, minutes to tell Ken Matthews, man, I miss that dude. He was always a good dude, but man, he was full of it sometimes, but, uh, much, much love to him. His son actually commented on my Instagram the other day. So, uh, hope you're doing well, Josh. We all miss your dad, man. That's so funny. Uh, you know, until I see a fish on the scale with my own eyes, I mean, that's what I'm going to go off of unless it comes from, a very, very credible source, uh, you know, supported by video and photo documentation, which isn't very hard to, to create these days. Not uh, anymore. No. Um, let's see. 190 acre lake full of grass loses 35% of its water every year, then gets filled every year. And I catch giants there. Is that due to the fluctuation of water levels? Yeah. Um, there's an old school uh, lake management technique called winter drawdown you can if you pull the the wa colder water holds more oxygen so it's safe to pull it down for the fish in the winter time and if you expose that soil to the bottom especially to freezing if it, the bottom freezes it'll crack all the weed seeds and, and it'll actually help you control the vegetation um so fluctuation in water levels um whether or not it's in the winter i would prefer it in the winter but that fluctuation will help you and will create that situation. Yes. Wow. Fascinating. They would do that like every two or three years at Lake Austin. Cause it's a constant level Lake on that Colorado river chain uh, every few years. Yeah. And I think it was a way to control yeah, that. Yeah, I like to see the that. Growth too. Well, and it just has a second effect as well. When you crowd those bass down in there like that, those big bass really go to work. So they add weight. And they um, eat other bass and control the small bass population that way because the small bass don't have any place to hide them. Yeah, I believe the lake record is like 16 pounds is caught on a drawdown year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll make mention of that uh, 1387 hooking bass up north is seen five years ago and a 12 two years ago. Man, I would love to see those on a scale because those are monsters for that part of the mm -hmm. country, man. It, Every time I go to Boston, it's cold as balls. So uh, I can't see that growing season being very long. Uh, here's a question for you, Shan. Like, is there a threshold in water temperature where there is no growth? Yeah, every winter. Um, your growing season runs basically above 60 degrees. So when your water temperature goes above 60, your fish begin to grow. When they drop, they stop. And you know that if you pull a fish's scale, it'll lay down growth rings on it like a tree. Got and it. you can age them. And when the growth rings get close together, you're counting the winners. Got just it. like a tree. So yeah. is that 60 degrees in the water they're swimming in or 60 degrees at the surface? Yeah, you know, uh, probably the entire lake. Like if it's 48 and 60 they're they're this not warm enough yet probably you know but it's in it's, it's right around in there um where they start to to get that the, the growing season that's why i say growing season because my fish were stocked in um on my pond in 22 so they were went in in may and they went to a, probably about october that year 
but then November, December, January, February, they're not growing. March, whatever the weather, maybe mid March, you know, they start growing again. So there's a lay, there's a layoff right there um, in the wintertime when I'm not getting any growth. But the females will add weight with the eggs, but that's not growth. So growth right? in terms of length and frame length. Yeah, versus length. girth. Yeah, well, okay. yeah, length is really my primary concern as long as I have the girth. Because for every one inch, like I, I had a post the other day, I had a 16 inch bass that came out of the pond that was like three one. I had a 17 inch that came out of the pond that was like four six. That one inch makes that much difference. Gotcha. So okay. 26 to 27 is critical for like the teener. You want you want teeners? You better go north of 26. Right. Right. I, I mean, man, every time I've caught like a 26 to 29 inch fish and it wasn't a teener, I've been highly disappointed. That sucks. Uh, but yeah, that happens. I've done that too, man. Actually, I've yeah. caught 27 inch fish that weigh seven pounds. Ooh, damn. The last 27 I remember was an 11 on the dot. And I was like, man, you're kind of hollow, but damn, your head and mouth is big. Like you kind of cheated me on that one. Uh, for those of that, yeah, those of us seven, that want to, really, yeah, for those that want to really geek out on like relative weight and understanding that concept, where can these people find this super dope tape measure of yours? Uh, it's linked in my uh, Shopify um, on my Instagram page right now. I'm still not. I'm really close to monetized on YouTube, so in the next couple weeks that'll happen, and I'll have you know, stuff over there as well. But for right now, it's just on Instagram um, or my website, aquaticbiologist.com. You can pick them up on there. I think she's got a link over to it. But, okay. Um, that'll I help. Just you. Oh, um, I just dropped a link to your Instagram um, here in the comments. So make sure you guys uh, go in there and check it out. Support Chan. He's got some dope merchandise as well. Uh, he's spreading the good word and the science uh, for – for all of us to benefit from uh, make sure you guys subscribe to his YouTube channel. Let me try to find that real quick. Uh, tell us about your YouTube channel. What have you been having fun with it uh, doing the most? Well, YouTube is an interesting, um, I, when I, I started doing this, this drives me this, just this, this entire process, what we're talking about. I'm very passionate about it. Um, I haven't, I've done it for five years online now. I haven't been paid very much. Don't really care. Didn't even really get in, get into it for money. You know, I just, it was a pet peeve of mine that we have all this misinformation going around about our bass, but it blew up, man. It just, Instagram went crazy. And I went to like, I don't know, 10,000 people in a year or something, maybe. Um, it's slowed down since then, but that bled over to YouTube and I started learning from guys like you and literally you can actually get money there. You know, you can get paid for people to watch it. So I started just kind of doing YouTube too. And, um, finally, like one of my posts hooked up, got a million views. I got like 6,000 followers in just a couple of weeks and YouTube really started taking off for me this year. So I like it better one because there's financial incentive, but, um, the shorts, the long format video and the lives all, it's like a three headed monster. You know, you need to be good at all three. And yeah. that's been the hard, that's been the challenging part about YouTube, but I'm doing, I'm doing better. I'm sorry about my editing on the long format video guys. If you guys want to go back through, I have a, a Sugar Hill Outdoors playlist where all this pond stuff is there. I've just, it's, it's on that playlist and it's good information. It's just bad editing. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, if you can watch that, you'll get it way ahead of the game. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to catching up to the content you've been putting on that platform. Uh, unfortunately, I've been mostly digesting short form stuff through Instagram because I got way too much going on. So I appreciate everybody tuning in to our channel. Make sure you guys subscribe to Shan's channel as well. Uh, and normally we take these live streams down and only allow our membership uh, viewership 
uh, after the fact, but this is a very important topic. So we're going to leave this one up here publicly, but if you guys want to watch the 100 plus, probably maybe 200 live streams that I've done over the years with all kinds of awesome guests uh, over the years on a multitude of topics, there is a lot of information being shared uh, only on our YouTube membership and uh, my Patreon as well. But uh, I mean, you can have access to everything for just 99 cents a month. And we've all got fishing tackle that uh, it was more than that, that we wasted our money on. So uh, that small kind of patronage uh, is a great way to support this channel and any other channels like Shans that you guys appreciate, uh, as well as supporting with merchandise and showing people that you're tuned in and sharing, sharing the word, uh, share this with your friends. Uh, if they're giving you crap about uh, the idea of selective harvest, uh, reference this video uh, so they can get some insight and some new perspective. Because at the end of the day, the whole reason I'm stirring the pot and willing to make myself public enemy number one in the bass fishing world is because I built a brand and a lifestyle based on big bass. I need them to exist to continue to do what I really, really love to do. Uh, and this is one of the ways that we can control uh, within the rules and laws and, and factors set in place to kind of allow the potential for it to happen. Doesn't mean it's necessarily going to bring those big ones back. But over the last several years, inaction is definitely not bringing any of it back. So uh, get excited about uh, going actually trout fishing and changing up the, the conversation uh, in that manner instead of bitching about bass not getting fed. Trust me, it'll go a lot further. Uh, explore this idea of selective harvest of our beloved green fish because uh, as much as you love that bass, man, he killed a lot of little bass uh, on his way up. Uh, to, to reach his, you know his his point in life now. Yeah, he did. I don't feel bad about it, man. It is just nature. Um, uh, we have a couple more questions. Uh, let's just rapid fire through these because I'm getting yelled at. Um, it's already eight twenty three here on the Pacific Coast. It's already uh you know eleven something in in Florida. Skeeters out in full effect out there. I'm sure. Oh, they're brutal. Oh um, uh, man, I don't miss those. How were no. bass growing so large in the 90s in California? Less fishing pressure? Uh, and I'm going to chime in on that a little bit. The less fishing pressure has never been a thing. Uh, outside of maybe them not seeing a big bait at the frequency that they're seeing them now, the fishing pressure has always been there. Uh, actually, it's probably even more so back then. The, our right. small lakes are getting 100, 150 boat draws in the tournaments. Yeah, you're talking like a two to four thousand acre lake, maybe. That's a crap load of boats. Uh, they feel crowded now with eighteen to twenty five boats. So, if anything, the fishing pressure was worse. Uh, what what factors would you say attributed to that outside of what I just described, Shan? From what you know, um. I would say that that was really close to a time period when people kept every bass they caught. Mm -hmm. You know, coming out of the 70s and 80s, there wasn't any catch and release. Catch and release was started by bass fishing tournaments. They had a PR problem. And mm -hmm. when they went to the ramp and they released the fish, they didn't handle it. They, they still don't do a very good job handling, in my opinion, but they have improved greatly. Um, but back when they first started, they really killed a lot of fish and got a lot of negative PR. Catch and release was born. Um, science did not do that. PR for BASS did that. Wow, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, Derek O wants to know, do the lakes that are taking down extremely low levels for years for dam maintenance end up getting the new lake effects? They can. They can also um, come back and just be totally screwed up. Like if you drain a pond down, you want to eradicate all the fish out of it and start it clean. Um, if you leave fish in there, like, say, predatory fish, green sunfish, crappy, things like that, it 
they're, they'll eat your bass fry and they'll disrupt the balance. I don't want predatory fish in there. I want my, I put my bluegill in my pond first. I let it go for about a year and then I put my bass in. I let the carrying capacity fill with bluegill and then I added a predator to control them. If I didn't add the predator, the bluegill would stunt and die. But that's kind of how that works short format. Got it. So uh, should I kill as many of those like two and three pound fish out of casitas that I described as possible? Yeah, I don't think you're going to, you're not hurting anything by keeping any bass. I'm in any lake we fish, man. Cool. All right. Good to know, man. I hope that new lake effect takes hold there because that place was freaking special, man. Yeah. Uh, all right. Our man Flores actually just asked, uh, I forgot to mark the question. He wants to know if you think forward facing sonar is going to condition fish eventually. Yeah, I think um, you're going to find that as that advances, it's it's really no different than um, the guy that I described at his pond who's put every lure, worn the paint off every lure at Bass Pro Shop, right? So the fish are going to become aware of the boat. They're going to become aware of that. They're going to become aware very quickly to that, um, which could work against the forward-facing sonar guys after a while. Um, and I think skew it towards small boats, kayaks, um, bank fishermen, uh, or, or even, even as much as just killing the electronics altogether. Like I've already seen guys doing that on the internet. They'll scope them from 120 feet and kill the whole system and move in. And I think you're probably going to see that more and more of that happening. They're going to, they're going to get clued into that pretty quickly. Yeah, I agree. When I, when I caught that 11 plus pounder on that baby bass pattern cast diving popper last year, uh, on Ivy, I'm I fish with all of my sonar turned off. Yeah, and I would wind drift and try to maintain the stealthiest approach I could. Yeah, uh, and that, that continues to be a, a solid strategy for me. And honestly, I, I've done better trophy fishing out of the smaller boats over the years. Yeah, smart guy, so, Oliver. You're figuring all that stuff out like that. Oh man, it's not hard to to observe failure <laughs> it can be hard to to adjust and make uh, you know adjustments to that to reduce the amount of failure but you know it's part of fishing uh it's what i enjoy yeah, yeah. what i don't enjoy is getting heckled by the love of my life about yeah i was gonna say i think you're getting some instructions there oh yeah i've, already, I've been ignoring text messages and stuff because i'm enjoying this conversation personally um, but we got one last question here from a man, Albert, who's been on a personal training session with me uh, in the Austin area. He's recently seen some zombie looking bass roaming very high in the water column recently. Their skin looks like it's peeling and they've, uh, they look far gone. Is that due to them keeping in the live well? I wonder what this peeling um, look is. Is it like more of like a white fuzz like a fungal infection like you see in aquarium fish perhaps because i don't know if i've actually seen like loose skin like hanging off of meat bacterial infections can get nasty on fish that's why we touched on that you know earlier in the pod um i would need a, a picture really but yeah i would say that um that sounds like poor fish handling uh, boat flipping maybe maybe a boat flip into that's the part that cracks me up man it's like okay we're going to boat flip it onto a 120 degree dry carpet leave it out of the water for five minutes and then and then handle it with dry hands and hug and kiss each other and then uh and then put it back like we've done it some kind of a favor right. um, that's the part that drives me the most it's like okay can we just please like not do that because yeah. that all right so you give a th let's say you give a nine pound bass a bacterial infection from mishandling it now the energy that it's eating is going to its immune system to battle an illness that could have been prevented instead of putting on growth Man. you're defeating the entire purpose of catch and release <laughs> right by mishandling the fish so i will say a younger version of myself justified doing that 
because I've had catastrophic failure fishing solo, trying to land a fish with a net. And I've seen it yeah. play again and again that way. You lose control and focus on that fish, yeah. uh, scrambling for that net. So I found the best scenario in, cer- in, in some, in honestly, most circumstances, if I'm fishing solo and I've got that hook placement well, is to bounce that fish to land it. Yeah. And um, I've gotten better at like not slamming them into yeah. the boat doing that. And if you watch more recent videos over the last several years, even when I do boat flip them, I try to do it as gently as possible. Um, but I, I actually have not fished solo very much at all the last several years. So with that being said, there's a ranger net in the boat. Somebody needs to be on that net the moment someone hooks up. And I've gotten pissed at friends of mine. That yeah, yeah. Will just stare at me and stare at the net. Like, what are you doing? It's like, dude, I would have been the first dude on that net for you, regardless of like the size of the fish, because you don't know until you know. Right. Um, and I don't have uh, a problem with the boat flip. I would just say in a boat flip, it have your partner just wet the deck real quick, just or just keep keep the deck a little bit wet, and it'll be so much safer for the fish. Yeah. Um, it's, that's the primarily the, the slime coat is my primary concern. Like they're so tough, you know, you can bounce them around a little bit. I'm not too worried about that, but that slime coat is, is really important. Gotcha. All right, boys and girls. Um, appreciate everybody tuning in. Uh, I, I am still going through the aftermath of our PCS show. Uh, we do have a handful of these fish, everything glides, uh, my man Sean Place has actually got two of these now, and he's actually been catching some nice bass in New Jersey, of all places. Uh, and I've been swimming this taxi trout that Victor makes. This is a 10-inch uh, long, skinny profile trout glide that swims incredibly on a wide glide. And I've been drawing a lot of these medium-sized bass to come up and investigate. Uh, and it's going to be a matter of time before I actually get them to, to eat. We've got a incoming front coming uh, i think tomorrow i'm sorry friday nights through sunday so we got some low pressure some cloud covers some wind some rain uh, i'm feeling pretty good about my chances of converting some uh, medium bass dreams unfortunately um so if you guys want uh want uh, one of these baits just shoot me a direct message on instagram uh, i've got a handful left i got a couple crank downs i've got a couple of the golden belt custom uh collaboration guy uh glides our man brandon exner was fishing um uh, the one uh golden belt custom in this uh big bass dreams exclusive color we called uh overcast because this color i've just busted their ass on in overcast conditions he had like 27 or 28 pounds of largemouth uh, off the shoreline which is pretty good for upstate New York. And when I say upstate New York, I'm thinking about Syracuse, like proper cold as balls uh, until a muskie came up and ate it. (laughs) Oh, awesome. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Which is an awesome fish. If you're, if you're prepared for them. Right. Uh, But yeah, we've also got a lot of the new merch, including these uh, new catch fish, not feelings hats, uh, uh, a lot of the legacy designs, like the recreational biologist, that's one of my homages to actual professionals like Shan. Uh, I have personally always uh, respected and appreciated what they contribute. Uh, there seems to be an aversion of science in this country for some strange ass reason. Uh, I don't yeah. get it. Yeah, maybe it's those kids that try to make fun of me for being a nerd and dork all my life they finally all grew up and, and found that like there's a similar voice out there through the internet uh and haven't been able to drown out uh, the science i don't know but it's frustrating on my end uh yeah you know i try to i try to approach my fishing through science and even uh you know, trying to utilize a scientific method, Shan, of observation and creating a hypothesis and a theory and then testing it with my experiment, which is every cast I've ever made, observing the results and then trying to adjust that experiment going forward. 
Uh, that comes from. Well, I think you're excellent at it. Thank yeah, you. you can't. I think. I think you can be a good fisherman without the science. But Agreed. I've never seen anybody come away from my page and say that that hurt them to understand the biology a little bit better either. You know what I mean? Right. I I really do. I, know that what I, I don't know that what I, I don't know that what I teach makes you a better fisherman. What I teach makes you confident and that makes you a better fisherman. Well put, well put. So uh big shout out to you, Shan. Uh, we'll be in conversation, man. I got to come on your channel um, and do a live stream on your YouTube. Oh, so. yeah, man. Anytime. Let's let's plan that out. All, yeah. all we'll have a good time. <laughs> now, I was messaging Shan earlier this morning that I wanted him to come out west so he can actually be an authority in this video where I catch and bonk a largemouth bass on video. Um, yeah. Yeah. To hopefully deflect, uh, you know, animosity and death threats and slash tires in the parking lots and and such, and show people that there is a reason to the madness. Um, you know, and it's based off of uh, observable, repeatable science. And one thing I love about science, Shan, is that it's peer reviewed, right? It's it's experiments that can be duplicated to achieve the same results, no matter if your biggest uh, hater is one of your peers right right like yeah. how, many, how many hypotheses and, and theories have been validated over the years by competing scientists right yeah it's interesting <clears throat> excuse me interesting you say that because you know i have colleagues that follow me i have my teachers follow me okay and believe me if I was messing up, they would light me up. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, they would destroy me. Um, but where a guy, a guy with a PhD is a smarter guy than me. Okay. I'm not that smart, but I got a lot of boots on the ground experience that, way more than they do. You know, so just uh, on that note, everything I've said here is not my opinion. And everything I said here, I learned at school. So if anybody has a problem with it, it's not with me. You're going to need to take that up with Auburn University, the University of Georgia, Clemson University, the University of Illinois, um, and every other fisheries program that studied fish for the last 100 years. I did not give you an opinion today. Right. Not one. I think that's the trap that we as bass fishermen can fall on you know, fall into because we're so damn emotional and passionate about these fish. We let our opinions, uh, well, that's good. our decisions. That's bias. And that's why you have to learn. I think I, I, I talk a lot about learning how to take the bias. You know, we have to, as a scientist, you have to remove the bias. You ha that's the hardest part is like what you think is going to happen versus what you measure happening. And I would love nothing more to have come on here and say, hey, whatever everybody on TV is correct. I'd be way more popular, but I would be a liar. Right. So here we are. <laughs> I don't know what else to do. Bravo, man. Uh, appreciate you. Uh, appreciate everybody tuning in tonight. Um, stay tuned to my Instagram. I'm sure I'll have another uh, shocking piece of content. <laughs> to promote <laughs> message uh going forward it's not going to end uh and hopefully it it results in a return of big bass uh not only in southern california it will yeah i hope so i i have faith it will because it's backed by the science always do the right thing spike lee yeah man yeah and dude shout out to the people that were dropping friday quotes man uh you guys give me hope I appreciate you. Shout out to my man, uh, Chacon RVP Fishing. He is now the proud owner of my original Dream Machine uh, 1.0, little tiny skiff project. He's been uh, showing that little boat lots of love and attention that it deserves. And uh, Jake, I'll be in touch, brother. Um, you guys all have a great evening. Uh, get out there and go fish this weekend. 
uh, we got that storm coming. Uh, our lakes are behind. So uh, your chance at a big, fat pre-spawn bass with incredible uh, relative weight is definitely wide open for probably the next four weeks. Um, yeah. Good luck. Aim high, dream big. Catch you guys later. Peace.